Welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here to talk about stuff this week on the show. It is another Weekly Suit Gundam extravaganza, part three of our journey into Mobile Suit Gundam 00 with the movie that is a sequel and finale to the TV series, Awakening of the Trailblazer. Uh, Awakening is two words, Trailblazer is one word, Uh, but in any case, it is a movie and we are going to be talking about it. Uh, and finishing off the the double O era of Mobile Suit Gundam, and I'm very excited to record this one, Sean. Yes, this, it's uh, it is one of the more peculiar pieces of Gundam I feel, um, and I'm very excited for this podcast. That is a good way to describe it. So anyway, that will be coming uh, if you listen to the Gundam parts. Before then, though, we have a little bit of stuff, little bit of news. There was a report from Jason Schreier in Bloomberg about uh, it made headlines for this some Last of Us news. But really, it paints a broader picture of some some things going on in Sony, some growing pains, we might say. Uh, so I am interested in talking about that as well. Uh, but Sean, how have you been? What have you been up to? I've I've been pretty good. You know, I've been watching watching my Gundam, um, and I have also been playing a little game uh, that people might have heard of called Diablo. <laughs> so yeah, yesterday um, I was doing debate tournament stuff. That was like not me like really active at the debate tournament, but more I had to be on call to like if they needed an extra judge, meaning I had to be around my computer. So I was sitting at my computer, I was like, "Well, what should I be? Do? I don't want to grade because that's exhausting and work related. I don't want to do that on a Saturday." Um, and then I was watching some footage of the Diablo two remake. Um, because a the alpha test happened for like select people got into like a network test or whatever. Um, and that looks really rad. I was like, well, I now I really want to play Diablo because I was watching Diablo 2. But I don't want to actually play Diablo 2 because I don't want to spoil it for myself before the remake comes out. Um, so I was looking around to see what a good way to play Diablo 1 was. And it turns out that a couple of years ago, uh, Good Old Games or GOG got access to Diablo 1 and have a like version of that game that will just run on any modern computer, which is great because original Diablo 1... The disc version does not run on uh, any modern computer, really, because that game is super fucking old now. So if you are interested in playing the original Diablo, you can just get it for $10. Bucks. Um, it has Diablo and the uh, not often remembered uh, expansion Diablo Hellfire that was made by Sierra um, is there as well, which the expansion is kind of whatever. It's That stuff's not that interesting. But Diablo 1, I have put about four or five hours into that game yesterday, and fucking Diablo 1 is still so good, Jonathan. That game fucking rules. I am 100% buying this. I am bookmarking the page right now. I did not know GOG. GOG always is a good place to look. They have lots of cool stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I actually grabbed the uh, the Doom wads from there the other day because I needed that for uh, GZ Doom. And I just decided I'll pay five bucks for that. It was good. So yeah, uh, I have I have never thought of going back and playing Diablo 1. But now I, because I'm excited for Diablo 2 also. So I will 100% play that. That sounds awesome. Yeah, no, Diablo 1's uh, a fascinating game, and, like, it's been a long time since I played it. I think probably the last time I, I played any of it or, like, touched that game at all was probably, like, 2012 or 2013 or so. Like, it's been a long time. Um, so it's fun to go back to it. Um, one, because that is a game that I have so many fond memories of from being, like, a little kid playing that game. And so all, like, the sound effects and the music and all that stuff and the art style, it's, like, ingrained in my... Um, subconscious of being a kid and playing that game obsessively Um, but it's also fun to play it and see like it's got a very like Dragon Quest 1 effect to me of it's so stripped down of a game compared to where the genre has gone like Diablo 1 doesn't have skill trees all you get when you level up is you get five skill points that you put into the stats you want to put into so like the classes in Diablo 1 are kind of pointless because it's kind of like the classes in Dark Souls it gives you a slightly different starting equipment and slightly different stat distribution. But other than that, there's no difference between like the sorcerer and the rogue and the fighter are all basically the same thing. 
Um, it's just this very raw, pure um, action RPG like loot driven game um, that it's yeah it's I've I'm very pleased by how much it feels like it's held up because it's also not super long. I'm like over halfway through the game and only played it for about five hours. Um, I'm at dungeon level ten. I'm like halfway through the caves and there's sixteen total levels of the dungeon because there's like four areas and the four areas are split into four different levels um so yeah no it's diablo one that game fucking rules that's awesome and, and we're gonna have to do some more diablo content later this year um because we've talked about diablo on and off a lot i don't think we've ever had a episode headlined by a diablo topic no yeah because so... we played diablo 3 at different times and so yeah, yeah. i think it has like never kind of come up as a concentrated thing but I'm sure, I mean, Diablo 2 this year, Diablo 4 at some point, there's there's going to be plenty in the future of this podcast. So I will 100% play that. That sounds awesome. Um, I've been playing a lot of stuff on my PC too. I told you guys last week about how I'd started playing Halo mouse and keyboard because uh, my brother and I started running through. We decided to just, we were kind of bored and didn't know what to play. So we started, we realized we had not done a co-op run on Halo Reach since it was added to the Master Chief Collection. Uh, I had, I think we both played the campaign independently, but we hadn't done it co-op. So we wound up just trying that, uh, and then we wound up playing that whole game. We've also played all of Halo 1. We beat that last night, just going through that. And so I've now played two full Halo campaigns, Malice and Keyboard, uh, and I will never go back. It is the perfect way to play Halo. It is amazing. Um, the, the sad part for me is that if I want to play through all the campaigns before Halo Infinite this way... Um, there is one Halo campaign that is not available on mouse and keyboard, and it's Halo 5, because they haven't put it on PC. Hmm. That's um, interesting. I didn't realize that they hadn't <clears throat> moved that one over yet. They haven't, and I don't think they will. I, it, it sounds to me like that is a maybe impossible project, because that game is so bespoke to Xbox One, hmm. um, because of how like weird it was made. Um, what's extra weird for me is that they haven't just patched in mouse and keyboard support for it on Xbox One, because there are actually a lot of Xbox One games that you can play mouse and keyboard. Um, a lot of first-party ones, Gears 5 from your Xbox, you can play that way. Call of Duty Modern Warfare, you can play that way. Um, so it would seem to me easy enough to patch in on Halo 5, but I'm not a game developer, I don't know. Um, but yeah, um, Halo 5, they have not brought over, and it doesn't sound like they're going to, which is weird. Yeah, I mean, I'm get, I mean, those other games already have PC versions, so that's probably why is that they just like right. didn't bother to take it out rather than like adding it in. Might be, I mean, I'm sure that that would be a lot more work, um, just because if it's not the game's not built to do it, it might just be a lot of shit to have to deal with and like bug fixes and all that kind of stuff. True. Yeah. No, it's not a huge problem, and Halo Five is the one that's the worst one. But I do kind of feel like I should give it another shot before Halo Six at some point. But that is dependent on Halo 6 ever coming out, which, you know, yeah. at this point it's sort of the gaming equivalent of the Winds of Winter. Who knows? Um, just kidding. Halo 6 is definitely coming out someday. Uh, Winds of Winter is not. Um, yeah, so I've been playing that. That's been fun. I am currently on the hunt for my perfect gaming mouse because I have been trying several of them. Um, you know, one of the great things about Amazon.com they're an evil company, and you don't feel bad when you order stuff with the pure intention of trying it out and returning it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've been trying a couple different ones. I will probably tell that story next week when I have like settled on one, and I can tell you guys what I what I like to play with. Um, but yeah, it's it's been fun. Uh, I've also been playing just because like, what's a better game to just try out your mouse and keyboard setup with than Doom? And mm -hmm. and I have just been doing a lot of that. GZ Doom, if you don't have it on your computer, is an awesome program that like ups up you know does it all in in like you know your your monitors frame rate and resolution and all of that and gets it in widescreen and it looks and plays great and um they actually have the new unity ports for doom on pc now the ones that are on console but if you have a pc i don't know why you would run those ones there you can play them in the unity ports are great for console they're not nearly as good as like just the, the basic wads through gz mm -hmm. doom um but yeah so anyway doom is good that's good uh, i beat yakuza 7 sean awesome congratulations there is a Yakuza game I have played more of than you. This is fucking weird, isn't it? This is true. I mean, you've got a long way to go to actually catch up to me. I've got uh, seven games on you still, uh, if you count Judgment. So, or eight? Eight, eight if you yes, count Judgment. Zero. Yeah, because <laughs> I forgot. There's a, there's, the numbers are all crazy now. So yeah, you, you've got a ways to go to before you actually catch up. But yes, no, you, you are, you, you are mo more Ichiban than me. Uh. We will, again, I'll hold off until you're done with it, Sean, and we can do a full episode on it. But Yakuza Like a Dragon, 
is one of my favorite games of all time. It is a masterpiece. It is fantastic. It has a phenomenal story. It has phenomenal characters. It's a JRPG, and I love that. Um, it is beautiful. The ending is phenomenal. Um, it, Sean, as you you warned me, yes, you just you finish the game and you put down your controller and you watch a half hour movie, and it's mm-hmm. a good half hour movie. Um, and God, it's Kasuga Ichiban is one of my favorite video game characters ever. Just like inner, inner circle, best video game characters. The performance by the Japanese voice actor is tremendous. All the other characters are great too, but but Ichiban in particular is great. Uh, and I'm super curious where they, they go with the series from here because I don't... I actually was going to ask you this, Sean, like... If, I don't know like how Yakuza 1 felt at the end of that game, and, and I know you played them in the order. You start with like Yakuza 0 and then went on to Kiwami. But this one feels like they told Kasuga's whole story, and I really can't imagine a sequel, um, let alone like seven Kasuga games. But like, um, how did they keep that engine going for Kiryu? Is it just much more serialized in that sense? Um, n- no. Um, every Yakuza game feels like it could have been the last Yakuza game, um, other than Yakuza okay. 0 obviously being a prequel. Um, but yeah, like that was one of the things playing Yakuza Zero and knowing that there were a bunch of sequels. There's a bunch of characters introduced in Zero that I'm like, oh, I'm really excited to see like these characters are going to be around for so long. And then like 80% of those dudes are dead by the end of Yakuza 1 because that game was not made with a sequel in mind. Um, so okay. Yakuza 1 very much like it could have very easily ended at the end of Yakuza 1. It does not have a sequel hook at all. Other than that, like Kiryu is and Haruka are alive at the end of that story and there can be more stories. <laughs> Other than that, there's nothing specifically with a sequel hook. And that's kind of how um, more or less all of them are. Um, there's a shocking number of games that basically end with Kiryu on his deathbed um, and then and then surviving at the end. I mean, none of them end with you like being convinced that Kiryu is actually dead, but they have that sense of finality where every single end of those games is like, oh, this could be the last one because this really pushed him to the edge. Um, it never felt like they like made those games with, we're going to leave something for sequels to handle. It always felt like we're going to do everything we can in this one game, and then it's going to be very good, and then we're going to make another one because it's very good. And, and there's still stuff you can do because the characters are great. But yeah, the plot's always wrapped up. That's fascinating to me just because like there's so many of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but that's great. That's that's cool to hear. And Yakuza 7 definitely exists in that lineage. So yeah, it's cool. I will have to play more of these, Sean. And there are a lot. So I don't know how I'm going to do that or win. But at some point I will. Uh, I did, after finishing Yakuza 7, I jumped into Ratchet & Clank. On the PS5. This Mm -hmm. is the 2016 game that is sort of a reimagining of the original PS2 Ratchet and Clank. um, And just got its PS5 upgrade. So it's up to 60 FPS now. Um, They don't call it a PS5 upgrade. It's still like PS4 in your tab because everything on the PS5 is confusing. But it is effectively the PS5 version. It runs at 60. It loads super fast. All of that good stuff. Um, And I've been playing. I've played about an hour of it. So I'm not reviewing it here or anything other than to say it is fucking delightful. And I really love it. Uh, and also, how did they release that game not in 60 FPS? That's one of those games I look at and I'm like, this just like, there's a law, right? That this kind of game has to be at 60 frames per second. Because it's like this kind of like action platformer. Um, but it, it, it looks and plays gorgeously and I'm glad it's gotten that PS5 upgrade. Uh, and it's free for everyone right now because Sony's just giving it away, whether you have PS Plus or not. So no excuse not to give it a try. Um, I am enjoying that and I am excited for uh, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. I am sure we will talk more Ratchet and Clank later this year. I am glad uh, they are more of an active thing for Sony because other than that 2016 game, they've sat the last generation out, which is too bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to check that out. I'm glad that they did the patch or whatever to yeah uncap the frame rate. Like One thing that I did watch the uh, Digital Foundry video, uh, and I found that very interesting because they talk, they kind of go across some of the lifespan of that uh, franchise and talk about like where it was 60 and then when it had moved to 30 because it was 60 frames per second as a lot of those games were in the PS2 generation and then over the course of the PS3 generation a lot of the, like those kinds of games ended up going down to 30 um, and it seems like maybe hopefully maybe the PS5 is like reversing that trend and it's like a, a bell or something and we're like back on like the 60 side of things because it does feel like we're not getting you know for a lot of reasons, we're not getting a lot of game announcements, but basically every game that gets announced, I feel like it gets announced with, and it will have a 60 frames per second mode on the new consoles. Um, yes, Rift so. Apart, I, I did check. The new one does have 60. Mm-hmm. 
Um, yeah. It also has a higher resolution 30 mode, but like that's just it's that's one of those trends in video games that makes no sense to me of like why you would ever prioritize something other than frame rate in a Ratchet and Clank game. I I just like those are games that should like like Nintendo. May, other, since uh, Sunshine was 30 inexplicably, although they tried to do it in 60, um, you know, Mario games run in 60. It'd be really weird to pick up a Mario game and it not to do that. And Nintendo has just kept that going. Um, so it's it's nice to have. It's, it's Certainly there's a lot of stuff going on on screen in the, the 2016 Ratchet and Clank, and I assume that's why it couldn't run that fast on PS4. But it is nice to have. And I still... I'm waiting for the day. I still have not played a game on my PS5 that does not, or at least cannot, run at 60 FPS. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is maybe my favorite thing about the PS5 so far. Yeah, no, it's Although nice. I have also Frame rates are nice. Frame rates are nice. I've also discovered my least favorite thing about the PS5, Sean. Okay. Do you remember on the PS4, in some games, there was the share notification that would come up Final Fantasy 15 is one I remember where every time you enter a cutscene it would do this big notification that says recording has stopped because you've entered a blocked scene and then when you exit the blocked mm -hmm. scene it's like you're out of the blocked scene and I believe there was a way to turn that off on the PS4 there is no way to turn that off on the PS5 and Ratchet and Clank every time you go into a cutscene and come out of a cutscene it does that every single time and there's no way to turn it off on the PS5 because you can literally go into the PS5 notification setting and say, turn off all notifications. That notification will still come up. Please, Sony, what the, why do we need to be notified of that? Like, if why isn't it just if you try to record there, it tells you, hey, you can't record here. What? Why is that a necessary thing? Why are you ruining your games this way? It's dumb. Please don't do that. Stop it. Yes. I agree. Yeah, I I have not noticed. I because I that's one where like I feel like I feel like that's usually in Japanese games you get that. Like definitely some of the Yakuza games do that. Atlas games all do that because Atlas is weird about streaming their games. Um, but yeah, like at this point, like I never notice it anymore. But yes, it is a dumb. Like it is because it's like it's like needlessly intrusive. It's like three sentences long or something. It's like such a big message that pops up so like the notifications even fatter than something like a friend going online or a message popping up or a trophy. And it's loud. It does a big boom. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you say Japanese games. I mean, Ratchet and Clank is western and I just played yeah. 65 hours of Yakuza and Yakuza doesn't do that once in Yakuza does 7. Does it not? I thought Yakuza 7 did. Some of the Yakuza games definitely did at least on the PS4. I don't remember if PS7 does. I, really. I don't know about the other ones. I'm just saying 7 yeah. it never happened. So, yeah. Um, for whatever reason, please turn that off, Sony. It's dumb. Um, but yeah, other than that, enjoying video games and my PS5. It's all good. Should we do some news on the PS5? Yeah, what's going on in the news, Jonathan? Alrighty. Well, uh, we had a report out from Bloomberg this week by way of Jason Schreier, the video game shaman. Uh, and the big headline news out of this report was that a PS5 remake of The Last of Us is in development. And I want to talk about that because that is the most puzzling sentence I have ever typed out, I feel like. But the real point of the story is about Sony's visual arts service group, a support studio in San Diego. And the story kind of uses them as a stand-in for a general decline in morale in parts of the PlayStation family over a push towards bigger and bigger IP at bigger and bigger studios. Um, this is a story we didn't cover, Sean, and I feel like this is a good time to talk about it because in February we learned Sony had gutted the Japan studio team that made Knack and, uh, in particular for our interest, Gravity Rush, and has generally, outside of Team Asobi, which does the Astrobot games, it has pushed resources out of Japan towards big Western developers and franchises. Um, another little detail in the story was that the Oregon-based studio Sony Bend was rejected on a pitch to make a Days Gone sequel for very obvious reasons, because mm -hmm. that is a game that, uh, fun fact, no one has ever played. No, it's just... It's just that you, game you has sold like six million something copies, Jonathan, but yeah. <laughs> has it? Yeah, How no, that game, that game was actually quite, like, was successful, like, not to the degree I think it needed to be, because that game had, like, a very long, troubled development, but, like, relative to normal video game standards, th that game actually sold quite well. Have you ever met or talked to or heard from anyone who played that game? Not in person, but online, yes. I have not On, online. Online, okay. there are a lot of people that actually like Days Gone quite a bit. Um, okay. You're going I to be hearing about them now, because now they're going to be very annoyed that there's not going to be a sequel. Hashtag release the Days Gone cut. Yes, um, yes, the Snyder cut of Days Gone. I know that he wasn't involved with it, but somehow it has to be the Snyder cut. Um, but anyway, Studio uh, Sony Bend was moved over to assisting Naughty Dog on a new Uncharted game, 
while they are preparing their own original uh, IP for, for a later development. So that is all the, the news out of this report. The biggest news to me was just now learning that people have actually played Days Gone. That's amazing to me. Um, but yeah, what's, what do you want to break down here? What, Sean, what interests you most here? Um, let's, let's just do the last of us side. Cause I think that's the easiest one to talk about. Um, because I guess we, because we like know the most about it. Cause like the other stuff feels like it's a, like, there's a lot of like weird internal Sony politics that are kind of hard to like totally tease out, um, from that. But I feel like the last of us thing is a pretty straightforward topic to talk about. What the fuck do they mean by a remake of the last of us? It's seven years old. And it still looks fucking state of the art when you play it. What are you? What are they talking about? That's well, the weirdest thing I've heard. So, like, one thing I will say about this is, um, like, obviously we're not supposed to know that a Last of Us remake is in development right now, and presumably it would be something that would come out earliest 2023. 2023 will be the the 10 year anniversary of Last of Us summer 2023, and that is while like I don't need a Last of Us remake. I don't. You know, that's not what I'm looking for. Most remakes come out in that, like, 10 to 12-year window after the game comes out, right? That's when the Demon's Souls remake came out. That is um, the Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary. That came out 10 years after Halo 1. Um, so it's like, that's... While, like, it definitely feels crazy right now, I do think some of the reaction online is like, well, you know, all of those games were... All of those remakes are always in development a little bit before it feels like you need the remake because then it needs to come out when you feel like you actually want the remake. I think that's comparing apples and oranges. I think it's a weird comparison. Like, I, I yes, with some of these, but like, just the ways video game development and expectations and production values have changed in part due to things like The Last of Us. Like, comparing Demon's Souls 2009 to Demon's Souls 2020 is... I, I feel pretty confident that 2023 is not going to be that fucking different from 2021 in terms of the video game space. That, like, Last of Us is not going to feel like it needs that kind of an upgrade. Um, you can play it on your PS5 right now. Like, Demon's Souls, you couldn't. Uh, Halo 1, I guess you could play on your 360... Mm -hmm. um, but you could not play it in widescreen, you could not play it in HD, you could not play it online, um, all of these things that they added for anniversary, like, this is different, just like, what are the things, like, I guess it would load faster, well, you could add that to the PS4 version right now, um, they're not gonna be able to bump the frame rate, it's already at 60, you replace some textures, I guess, but that game already had state-of-the-art motion capture that still looks fine now, I, you know, like, I don't, I don't really know what we're talking about when we say we're going to remake The Last of Us in that sense. And and 2023 is not the far distant future where games are going to feel different. There's For one, there's just been a lot more continuity between generations lately in a way there is not when you're talking about a Halo 1 or Demon's Souls 2 when those were remade. Um, you know, that, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And I think that's what people are reacting to. It's... I think the actual like number of years isn't the thing here as much as like those those issues. Yeah. Um, you so, know, so one thing I'll say about because again, I'm going to say for me personally, I don't give a shit about a remake of The Last of Us. I don't need it. In 2023, right? The the high schoolers that I'll be teaching will, will they were six years old when The Last of Us one came out. The Last of Us remake would not be necessarily for us. It would be for this new generation of gamers let's call them uh who were too young particularly because the last of us is a game that definitely like you can be very much too young to play in a way that like halo you can be six years old and play halo and that's totally fine um but like that like i don't need the last of us remake i think a last of us remake that comes out in two to three years would make a shit ton of money i guess that's like i can see why sony would make it i don't need it but i think it would find its audience um and I'm guessing if what they do is if they timed it to here's like not a full remake, obviously of last of us two, but like a, here's a, like what, like the PS4 version of last of us one was right. Like a, here's more than just a patch. Here's like a nicer version of last of us part two that has a little bit more like work put into it. And then whatever the multiplayer thing that they originally had been working on the last of us two multiplayer. And then they split that out because last of us two became so huge and have been working on that like presumably since then like they've said that it's an ongoing project if all that stuff is timed together to be one package that is like 70 dollars or whatever in 2023 i think that that would do extremely well 
I don't disagree, but we're arguing different things. Like I, I don't, I don't say I don't get the business sense for it. I mean, oh well, yeah, yeah I guess, Sony... but that's because you, I guess you framed it as like, what are we even talking about? And it's like that's what they're talking about, right? They're sure. going to make money. Like, do I want it? Not really. No, and and I mean, it's the this is going to be interesting because uh, uh oh, Sony did backwards compatibility this time. How do they resell us all their shit? It's going to be the question, I think. Um, and I guess this is our first view. I think it would be really weird if they wait that long for a PS5 patch for Last of Us Two, just because everything else from PS4 is getting its PS5 patch. Like I said, oh. if it would have to be not a patch, it would be a yeah. PS5 port of Last of Us Two. They sell you it again. That would, yeah, that would do more than just raise the frame rate cap and maybe raise the bounds of like the dynamic resolution or something because the the patches yeah. that they've been doing for ps4 games are relatively limited in what they can do like a full ps5 port they could do dual sense integration and sure. all that kind of stuff yeah i mean we'll see yeah i i just i guess that is the bigger question for me is like the uh um Sony's general reticence towards backwards compatibility plus, but they did do it for PS4 for, on the PS5, plus they really like reselling you their games. Uh, I'm really curious what that's going to start looking like. And uh, a Last of Us remake sounds ludicrous to me. On a business level, it makes sense. I'm curious what it'll look like. Um, but yeah, so I guess that's that's what they're doing. Um, and then we'll see what happens with other games. Apparently, the studio that started making this remake, it's Sony's Visual Art Service Group, they were doing a remake of Uncharted to start with, Uncharted 1, which makes just vastly more sense as a remake, right? Because that's a game that actually has, like, is outdated in comparison to later games. Mm -hmm. um, although the the version that's on the, the Nathan Drake collection is totally fine for most people, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, so they're doing that. I mean, it sounds like we... It's been a pretty open secret that something is happening with Uncharted. It sounds like that is coming from within Naughty Dog. It has not just been completely passed off to another studio. Um, I and really hope this... that whatever that Uncharted thing is a like Lost Legacy style. I really hope yeah. it's not like, here's like another 12 hour long Uncharted game like 4. I like Uncharted 4 a lot, but I would much rather have, here's like a tight 6 hour Uncharted game for $40. Please, please let it just be that. I would too. I, I don't care about the length so much as I just hope it's not Nathan Drake. I hope yes. it's, they're making the right decision on it being a side story or a story with those characters, Chloe and um, Nadine. other character. Nadine, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so something like that. But yeah, we'll see. But then there is this general... I. So this is something I was thinking about when this story came out because we've praised Sony a lot for how high quality their big releases are. And they deserve that praise. They have a, if you own a PlayStation, you do get a pretty steady stream of really good first party titles uh, that have a really, really high standard of quality. Um, even if you don't like every single one of them, they tend to be very polished and well made and worth the money and all of that. And that's great. Um, but I do think this is like reminding us of some of the cost of what they're doing, which is that like, push towards bigger studios, push towards bigger IP, um, lack of development on some of this smaller stuff. Gutting the Japan studio is just heartbreakingly sad to me. Um, and I think you combine that with just the lack of interest in their past beyond something like The Last of Us and, mm -hmm. and just older PlayStation franchises and things that they, they could be putting out and making money on, but they're not. Uh, is is sad to me and and tells a story that is complicated. I would say, yeah. Like I'm, I think so. This all this stuff is a extension of God. When did all this happen? When did Jim Ryan take over? So because there was like a huge um, like shift at the uh, like corporate level within um, Sony, and a lot of that. So that will happen in 2018. Um, so in 2018, you started seeing like a big shift. And that's around when Herman Holst also became, so it used to be, uh, was it Andrew House that was the, or the, no, I think it was Sean Layden was the head of like Sony Interactive Entertainment. And then um, Herman Holst, who was the studio lead at Gorilla, he took over and he's in that um, Schreier story as being the person who the visual concepts team had to show what they had done on that remake of the last of us for and that's and then herman holst made the call to say let's move this over to naughty dog and have them handle on it internally um and so all of that shake up that started like about three years ago now and so i think we're starting to see the shift of that where so much of the power within 
the PlayStation side of Sony has shifted to Europe and America instead of being centralized in Japan, which is where it was obviously for the PS1 to PS3 generation, and the PS4 was more kind of split. And so I think we're kind of need to see the the effects of that kind of power shift within the corporation structure. Um, some of that is coming out now with like, yeah, having Japan Studio, which is, which is, yeah, it's super fucking sucks because Japan Studio has so much history with Sony. Um, I mean, like going back to PlayStation 1, right? Like, like the very beginning. Um, and it really, really sucks. They also hadn't made a game since Gravity Rush 2 um, outside of like doing like some licensing work and stuff that that, that studio also does um, or did. Um, but like in terms of development, they hadn't headed a game since Gravity Rush 2. Um, so like I'm really curious to hear or like I would love to get a deeper inside story, which I don't know if we are because it's at Japan and I think it's harder to get those kinds of stories out. Um, but I would love to know like what was going on there. Like was it that there were projects that just couldn't get off the ground and there were, cause they must've been working on something. Um, was it that like Sony was just sort of like slowly like pulling out and not giving them the funds they needed? Like that's the kind of stuff I'm really curious about where all that happened because Japan's Japan studio was just so quiet for so many years. Um, I would love to know what it was that like was happening in there and what games they were working on. I'm curious about the whole dynamics of the Japanese side of the industry re-PlayStation because, you know, a lot of Japanese developed stuff still comes out on PlayStation because that's sort of a default. Um, mm. it's, the, it's, it's the home console that's big in Japan. But I don't see Sony doing much to actively, like, court that. Meanwhile, Xbox has been going out of its way. Yakuza Like a Dragon had its Xbox Series X version day one. It took another six months for it to come out on the PS, uh, or that PS5. Was a, that was a, a paid exclusive. But yes, I understand that. Yeah, that's yeah. what oh, I mean. Okay, that's okay, courting. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. courting. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. That's a paid exclusive. That's what it means to court like Japanese developers. Um, and and you know Nintendo uh, does a lot of this too. Monster Hunter Rise on the Nintendo Switch. I don't know if you guys have seen the sales numbers on that in Japan. They are unfucking believable. Um, and like clearly, a lot of like that side of development is is. Um, the, you know, the big Japan Japanese games are favoring Nintendo more and more right now because the Switch is the highest selling system there. Um, so I'm just curious. Like, like I, I think Sony seems to be coasting on the Japanese side of things, but that was a huge boon to the PS4 throughout its lifespan was all the Japanese published stuff there. Um, and I, I wonder if, if this also just portends a lack of attention to that. Yeah, it might. Like, it's 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 definitely hard to say because the demand for PS5 is still very high in Japan, but, like, supply everywhere is so throttled um, that, like, I mean, it, it is selling well in Japan in the sense that it is selling every single console they have out there. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I think there's so much up in the air in terms of... I think it's, it's because of the combination of COVID and then what has happened with, like, the shortage of semiconductors that is a much, much bigger problem than video game shit, um, but is affecting all the video game stuff too, um, very heavily, obviously. I think it's becoming like, it's a lot harder to get a sense or a read on what is happening for me um, in areas of like the video game world. Cause it's been, you know, it's almost been like half a year since the, the, the new consoles came out, but it just like doesn't feel like anything has settled yet because every single game is getting delayed. Fucking Deathloop got delayed again. It is now coming out in September, right? It was supposed to come out, I think, in a couple of months now. Um, and so, yeah, like, it feels like every, like, all this stuff is taking a lot longer to happen than you'd normally expect it to happen. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we can't even really reliably say how the new consoles are doing because we're not at the point where you'd have an actual supply and demand to gauge that. We're at the point where they're selling everything they put out but you would expect that no matter what. So, um, and the shortages are so high, like there's just no way to say what the actual demand is, you know? Yeah, I mean, we can safely say that it's it's high for both of the consoles because because they've been selling out so heavily. Right. And like, and because the shortage affects them in the sense that like they should be able to, they should be making more because the demand is so high. But I mean, relative to like the number of consoles that they were putting out with like the PS4 and the Xbox One, it's not actually that different. Um, right. So it's, it's not like these consoles are doing poorly um it's that we don't know how well they they could be doing right that's what i mean yeah 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 so it's interesting um yeah so 
we'll see. We'll see about all of this. I mean, so far, I mean, I love the PS5. I was uh, hyping it up earlier today. It's a great console. It's a great place to play games. Um, I'm excited for all of their their big games. I do, you know, the the idea of Naughty Dog being on a treadmill between The Last of Us and Uncharted is sad. And, like, they haven't gotten to do a new IP since The Last of Us, which is almost 10 years old. So that's what I want to see from Naughty Dog. But yeah, yeah. But by my sense is, I don't think Sony is makes those calls. I think if you're like Naughty Dog, the sense I get, at least maybe this has changed since this power shift. Um, but traditionally, it has been if you are like one of the big studios at Sony, you do what the fuck you want. Um, yeah. The, obviously, that did not happen with Sony Bend, but also again, like the story of like Days Gone's development. It sounds like that game was kind of a clusterfuck and was very expensive. And again, even though it did sell pretty well, um, it did not sell super well and then it also a lot like you know it got kind of critically trashed and i didn't play it so i can't speak to that whether it was actually yeah. good or not but yeah it seems like Naughty Dog ass- can do what it wants to do have to assume sucker punch is getting to do ghost of tsushima too right because yeah. i mean they're they want to make a movie out of it also so i have to assume that's one that they consider a massive success because it was yeah, I think Sucker Punch uh, Insomniac also is in that realm. Um, cuz what cuz one thing I do want to say like uh, I cuz I of where I would love to know the other sides of so like cuz the Jason Schreier story obviously is only can't speak to like Sony is a huge company, PlayStation is a huge company. It's got a lot of arms. Cuz there's like some stuff of where I've seen like a lot of doom and gloom of people being like Sony's never going to fund or back smaller games. But, like, there's a whole sides of Sony, like, VR, where they're still doing, like, pushing for weirder experimental stuff. Um, because I can guarantee you that Insomniac probably has, like, two VR games that are being made for PS5 VR. Because they made, like, fucking five... They made... If you look it up, they made a stupid number of VR games for, like, like timed around the launch of um, the Oculus Rift. So I think people being too doom and gloom for, like, this means that we will never see smaller games backed by Sony that's i think certainly not going to be the case it probably means that like there's going to be less of an emphasis on that as there was over the course of the ps4 generation we saw that kind of lessen from what it was in the ps3 and prior i think we'll kind of see that trend continue but it's not like today sony is saying we will never back smaller video games ever again so just to close before we jump over to gundam i think i figured out what the last of us remake should be okay i think they need to do it final fantasy 7 remake style and it's the last of us colon remake and you just go it is super slow like joel's daughter dies at the end of the first game that's that's where you go it's just that that first 15 minutes is a full game it's basically like a shenmue spinoff like it's a life sim in like seattle where he's or in austin texas Mm -hmm. and just going around the city doing stuff there's no zombies until the very end uh and then that is that is one game and then another one that is everything up to getting to ellie um sephiroth is in there for some reason because it's also like a pseudo sequel um and then it becomes like a happy version of the story where uh at the end they both get the cure and save ellie life uh and it'll be like that it's a real like big remake on that level it's also a jrpg now for some reason yeah or when you said it should be like the final fantasy 7 remake i thought you're going to say it should like fucking ellie from the end of the last of us part two should like time travel back in time and be fucking <laughs> with the events of the last of us to like prevent the tragedy from happening um yes, and that's, that's what i mean yeah yes yeah, so that's what the whole game is because that would be fucking hilarious if they, they just they just leaned really hard into some crazy bullshit. Yeah. I, th- I think yes. The Last of Us remake is going to be a fancy looking version of The Last of Us and be very boring for people who have played The Last of Us like three times. All right. You want to talk some Gundam? Let's talk about some motherfucking Gundam, Jonathan. Hello and welcome to Weekly Suit Gundam, the special bonus podcast brought to you by the folks at the Weekly Stuff Podcast. I am Sean Chapman. And I'm Jonathan Lack. And we are here to once again dive into the wacky and wild and wondrous world of Mobile Suit Gundam with the conclusion of our trilogy of podcasts on Mobile Suit Gundam 00. Because today, Jonathan, we are talking about um, one of the strangest pieces of, uh, I think, Gundam media out there in the core lineage of Gundam, which is Mobile Suit Gundam 00, the movie, A, Awakening of the Trailblazer. The Trailblazer has been a wakened. Uh, yes. This movie is a hell of a thing. Oh, yeah. And this is probably the most unsettled my thoughts have been going into a conversation on Gundam so far. 
Yeah, and I will say this is easily the most my feelings on a Gundam thing have changed, and in this case very much for the better, um, based on rewatching it. Because I was extremely unsettled on this movie the first time I watched it. It's this and g Reco were the two things that, like, when we started this podcast, I was, I was very excited to revisit these specifically because I didn't know really how to feel about them. And rewatching this movie last night, I, I fucking love this movie. Holy shit. <laughs> I I don't dislike it. I, I want to be clear. Like I am. This is not a. Do I think it's bad or good? It's and and it's not even like I like the ideas and the story points. And let's just let's just let's quit be, be, you know beating around the bush. This is a movie about aliens. Yep. This is the big Gundam thing that deals with alien life. Uh, and I think if you are going to do a Gundam story about aliens. This is about the most true to Gundam way I think you could do it. And I like that aspect of it a lot. I have specific concerns with how it works as a movie. Uh, just at, like the film critic in me. I think it is... I, like, I think it's a little diffuse in the sheer number of characters. And how much plot it has to distribute among them. And I think the first hour is very slow. And, and I think it... This is a movie that would tremendously benefit from choosing someone to be your POV character and focusing it in a little bit because I think it, it sort of lacks that that tightness. Um, but when it's on, it's on. The animation is stupendous. Uh, and I very, very much enjoyed the last 45 minutes, including an ending that absolutely fucking goes for it. Oh, yeah. And that is the thing that I walked away most like. Hell yeah. Um, but it is, this is one where I kind of feel bad having only watched it once. That is the premise of this podcast, of course, yes. is that I'm the one seeing it for the first time. You've seen it multiple times. So I think this is going to be an interesting conversation because maybe I will be exactly where you are next time I watch this movie. Um, but for now, this is one that definitely, uh, threw me for a bit of a loop in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, one thing I will say though, is I I'm glad it, this is not one where I watch it and I'm like, oh man, they fucked up a great ending to the show. I'm glad this exists. This feels like a very valuable extension of what Double O is, um, and and like a, a very important part of that story and universe. Um, Seiji Mizushima is a hell of a director, um, but we'll get into all of that. This is a weird yeah. movie. Yeah, no, it's yeah, it's it is really peculiar. Yeah, and I'm with you that I think like so this movie's like reception is kind of all over the place. I feel like I've I spent a lot of time the other day trying to like get a bead on like what is like the general take on this movie and i don't know i can't tell i feel like everyone feels differently about the movie i don't i don't i feel like i'm probably like pretty far on the extreme end of liking it that there aren't a lot of people out there that i saw that like it as much as i have on the second viewing um but yeah there are some people that just despise this movie there are a lot of people that are kind of neutral on it there are a lot of people that like it quite a bit but but maybe don't love it um and that's true both for what i could find of the japanese fan base and the american fan base um, I think it is just like, I think it is a very difficult movie because it is f relatively high concept. Like it's very, like it's, it's working mostly, I think, on like a metaphorical or a symbolic level. Like and very intentionally, it is trying to work in that space. Um, and it is also like arguably not even really the same genre as Gundam typically is. Like, I don't even know if I would really call this a real robot show because like the real robot part of it is so like de-emphasized here. Um, so yeah, it's a peculiar movie that has a peculiar reception. Um, it did do quite well at the Japanese box office, like not like, you know, blowing down the house or anything, but it, like it, it was successful um, and it's reasonably enjoyed. But yeah, I, I, I did, there's no real like history part of this. Uh, the movie was something that they, you know, they wanted to make the movie. It's the same production team. It's the same cast, all that kind of stuff. It was made shortly after the end of the series. So, you know, there's not really any additional history into how this movie came about because clearly they knew that this movie was coming. They had this idea. It's built very clearly into the TV show. They set up the idea of encountering extraterrestrial life, some of the specific symbolism that is like in the ending of Double O Gundam with the flower, but is like, feels like it's actually exists to be used in the movie, like all that kind of stuff. It is not like there's a different story about how this movie came about. It is just purely an extension of the TV show. Yes. I mean, the TV show even ends with the little text card saying mm -hmm. the movie is coming. There's more to this story. So yeah, they knew they were doing it all along. It's, as I said before, it's the exact same format Seiji Mizushima's previous show, Full Metal Alchemist, had. The original Full Metal Alchemist was the same way, it just wasn't split into seasons. But they did all Full Metal Alchemist, they did the movie. The movie is also, 
a great I, I love the Full Metal Alchemist movie that one is also one that has extremely divisive reception the Conqueror of Shambhala movie I think it is really interesting it is very out there and it is definitely a movie that sort of sticks to its guns in terms of what it wants to be and it is very uncompromising in that I think that can all be said of the Gundam 00 movie for very obvious oh, yeah. reasons um, I think it's also worth noting Sean this is the first Gundam original movie since F91 Mm -hmm. So Gundam is in theaters all the time in Japan because of the various compilation movies. Um, and we have talked about the high profile ones like the original Gundam 79 and the Zeta Gundam New Translation. Um, but for the most part, Gundam has very few actual theatrical movies that are just movies. So Shars Counterattack, F91, this, and Gundam Narrative, I think are the only four, right? Yes, and then very soon we'll have Hathaway's Flash. Well, that will also be in that category. Yes. Um, and I, I might argue that uh, the Gundam Wing movie should just be best understood as a movie, the OVA, the Endless Waltz, because it yes, was very yeah. clearly a movie that was then split into three and then recombined into a movie, but it's very much a movie. Um, <laughs> yeah, so maybe you can say five overall, but this is the third of the movie movies. Um, and uh, we did talk about narrative on the Unicorn Gundam episode. We might need mm -hmm. to circle back around to that at some point because we didn't talk about it a lot. But yeah, um, so... This is, I will say, I, I do not view this rapturously in the way I did Shars, Shars Counterattack or F91, but it is cool to have a another proper like movie that was always planned to be a movie in the in the Gundam pantheon. Absolutely. So, so I don't want to give my big take on the movie yet because I want to hear yours, Jonathan. I want to hear more. How did you feel? <laughs> what are your takeaways? What is Gundam Mobile Suit Gundam Double O the movie colon A Awakening of the Trailblazer to you? It's a big question. Yeah, it is, isn't it? I feel very divided on it. I I think, like I said earlier, my problems with it are not as a story. The story elements, and I feel like this is where it's maybe divisive in the fandom, is just the, like dealing with aliens. I love that side of it. I think the idea that they decided to do a, a first contact alien story, and they do it without those aliens ever speaking a single word in the entire movie or really like clearly communicating in any way other than the very 2001 tree of life experimental big flash that sets and it gets at the end of the entire like creation and destruction of their entire form of life. That's the most like direct communication they have, but it's purely visual and operatic, you know? Uh, and, they're, and they're barely even humanoid. Like, there's a couple of moments where they assume something resembling human shape, but it's very few and far between. For the most part, they are just hunks of metal. And that is what we are communicating with, fighting, dealing with throughout the entire movie. And I think as a high-concept piece of sci-fi, that is fascinating. And I think it is executed, especially in the end, very well. And that it goes to some very big, broad places with it. And it is all in service of extending the central themes of the TV show into a big metaphor for this movie. Um, it's something very symbolic, as you say, Sean, about communication and understanding and pushing that to an absolute extremis point of these are things that do not look, feel, sound, act, behave anything like us. How do we understand them? And that is the fight of this entire movie. Um, that aspect of it, I love. Uh, Metal Setsuna at the end of the movie definitely threw me for a loop because that is one of the wackier images in the history of Gundam. Would you agree? <laughs> yes, but I will say that was like my main thing I remembered from this movie was just that ending because love it or hate it, that is a striking, memorable, oh, yeah. incredible moment. Like I, when I, I say, love that fucking ending so much. When I say sticking to your guns, that's what I mean yeah. of, of showing us Metal Alien Setsuna at the end of your movie. Um, so so I like all of that. I think as a, like an arc for Setsuna and Celestial being in this universe, it works. I just have some like... And, and this is where I need to watch it again. Because this is also sort of how I felt after like an initial viewing of F91. Is just figuring out the pace of this thing. You know, this movie is sort of having to do th the same thing season two had to do. But in a movie length. Which is get the gang back together. Start up the story again. You know, you've, you've kind of reached a down point. Now the story has to start up again. Um, and I do think it has a very long first act that has a lot of exposition and a lot of jumping around from character to character. And I feel a little, like, 
Gundam 00 is a very ensemble focused show and that is totally fine for a TV show and it is a strength of that show. I think in a movie it can feel a little diffuse when you are jumping between characters and have no clear POV. Uh, you know, Setsuna is our main character but is gone or quiet or just not there for very long stretches of this movie. Uh, I think the movie is overly concerned with having to touch base with every single character from the TV show. I think that is a problem that like it results in the the single clumsiest piece of writing in all of Gundam 00 is in this movie when you have the guy from the military who talks about Sergei Smirnov and I found that like a weird reading of Sergei Smirnov's entire life in Gundam mm -hmm. 00 and like a weird attempt like since he's dead we still have to bring him up because we're mentioning every single character from that show um and some of the like like I don't know if I needed as much of Billy Katagiri as we had and his weird fan service girlfriend um there's there's just like I, I wanted more focus at various parts of this. I don't think the movie finds an interesting place for Saji and Luis um, to the point where I wonder if it would be better for them not to be in it. But at that point, like they are so crucial to Gundam 00. Is it Gundam 00 without them? I wish they had found something more there for them. Um, so that's where I feel some messiness in just like its construction as a movie. But when this thing is cooking, uh, it is very well directed. The animation is great. The sheer scale of what they are imagining for the final like hour of this movie is incredible. And something like, especially for something that it was already as well animated as Gundam 00 is, you have to up the ante if you're going to do a movie. I do think they effectively up the ante. The battles are incredible. I think some of my favorite characters in terms of getting moments in this aren't the ones I would have expected. Like, I think Graham Aker kind of steals the show at various mm -hmm. points and gets a phenomenal... Like, that is one where I felt like I needed more of him at the end of the TV show, Gundam 00, like just a final resolution. And we get it in the movie, and I'm perfectly satisfied with that, you know? Um, and there's there's some other characters who I think get that kind of treatment. Um, there's some who don't have a lot of focus, but it's okay, because I think they were pretty settled at the end of the show, like Sumeragi, uh, and she gets an entire, like, space station for the future named after her so that's fucking great um yeah it's you know it's a movie i want to watch again it is a movie i want to digest again it is definitely one that once you see the shape of where they are going with it and where they are pushing setsuna and this world it felt right to me in ways that i i don't know if i can even verbalize but like okay yes this is the ending gundam 00 wanted and needed to have but also, like, man, what a fucking journey this show takes from starting uh -huh. in episode one with, like, the armed interventions and its very boots-on-the-ground Gundam grounded to where they go at the end of this. And yet, the best thing I can say for Gundam 00 is I do think that evolution feels very organic to what they were doing uh, and principled as an artistic thing. So that is my opening slew of words. Does that even make sense? <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, I, I think, yeah, because I think we're, as is common, I think we're, like, more or less on the same page with, like, the strengths and the weaknesses of the movie, but maybe, like, uh, judge them slightly differently. Because, and I think that's very much what my take was the first time I watched it, of feeling like uh, some of this movie I'm finding a little bit, like, perplexing. Um, it's it, Yeah, it feels sort of diffuse and kind of hard to get a hold of because the narrative perspective is it feels a little bit all over the place. It is, and yeah, I think it has a little bit too much of a tendency, for sure, of... And I and it's you know I get where this comes from. You're making a thing that's a movie for a TV show, so you want to like make sure that everyone's favorite character at least gets some screen time. So so let's have someone say the name Sergei Smirnov, so everyone could be like, hey, Sergei's in it. At least you know his fucking shitty kid Andre dies in this movie. Um, I'm sad he got a heroic death, but at least he's fucking dead. We can rest easy knowing that he's no longer in the world. Um, which I had forgotten. I didn't remember that he died. I didn't even remember he was in the movie. But I'm glad. I'm glad they got rid of him. Um, but yeah, so it has a little bit of too much of that urge. Um, and, but I was so intrigued at it. And um, like I said, I think a lot of like the major content of the plot of this movie in the years since I watched it, like if you had asked me a week ago what the plot of Double O Awakening of the Trailblazer was, I would have told you there are aliens in it. They think they're from Jupiter. And at the end, Cessna is a metal boy. Like I just kind of like, it was hard for me to hold on to <laughs> what like the main content of the movie was but that image of Setsuna at the end encased in metal embracing Marina and them saying we like I understand you we understand each other and then the double O quanta turning into flowers like that like 30 seconds or whatever of the very very end was stuck with me so hard that I've always really wanted to revisit this movie and upon revisiting it I think it is like really appropriate that we are doing this podcast right after we talked about on the weekly stuff, uh, a bunch of Godzilla stuff. 
Because going into this movie knowing what it is, this movie's just a kaiju movie with Gundam characters in it. Like, it is 100% top to bottom. It is just a fucking kaiju movie. And that, I think, is part of where that diffuse narrative comes from. And it's a sort of a love or hate element of a lot of kaiju movies is that they typically don't have clear, strong protagonist-type characters, but instead are assembled across a wide range of different characters that are here's the military people here's the scientist people here's the like reporter characters because there's always a reporter character here's this that and the other team here's like the the family because there's always a family group as well that might like each character represents one of the other diffuse groups of character groups um but those movies are much more that kind of kaiju movie is much more interested in constructing its narrative around the core central concept of what is happening in the movie more than characters. And that's very much what Awakening of the Trailblazer is. It is entirely a movie about this symbolic concept of what does it mean to understand one each other, one another. And it assembles everything in the movie around that idea of understanding, failure of understanding, how to push through boundaries, um, like what it means to be aggressive and create that like violence and how that disrupts understanding like all those different elements that are things the tv show explores so in depth often through character drama or like bigger plot machinations awakening of the trailblazer does through more high concept symbolism and metaphor like as embodied through primarily its alien nemesis the elves that are you know a fascinating kind of reflection of all those things of it is an alien race that seeks to understand things, but to understand things, it must consume them. Um, and so it reflects the things that it consumes. So its militarism reflects the militarism of, of us as we move out into space. Um, but then also they are so malleable and so able to understand one another once you break through that membrane because they can understand another, one another on that perfect level. And then sets at the end becoming a metal boy representing that fusion like i think all of those elements of the plot once you for me like once i let go of watching it as a gundam thing because i think it's hard to watch it too much through the lens of gundam outside that that core theme is a major gundam theme and not just gundam every fucking mecha thing is somehow about some metaphysical understanding people that's what Edeon is about that's what eva is about that's what bottoms is about that's what macross is about mecha just likes how do we transcend the physical and, and understand one another other than that core theme and the fact that it does have mobile suits in it, this is not much of a Gundam movie. But if you fucking put Godzilla in it, it would be a hell of a Godzilla movie. So I, I love that whole description, and I think linking it to a kaiju movie makes sense. Because I very much had the feeling I do when I'm watching a kaiju movie, because I am not in that life completely the way you are, Sean. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I might feel like a little bored, or I feel like the movie's a little slack, but then like the moments where they pull it all together, I go, holy crap, this is great. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and... I think this movie does that. I, I do want to defend it as like Gundam just a little bit more because I do think like it's such an interesting thought experiment to say like of all the Gundam stuff we've seen so far, if you were going to do Aliens, how would you do it in Gundam? And I think you could say, well, Gundam just, if you add Aliens, it's not Gundam anymore. And I think that's part of like maybe what we see here. But also like it wouldn't be Star Trek. It wouldn't be Star Wars. It would not be any of the other like sci-fi that we generally think of when we think of Aliens. It would be this. It would be the... Because Gundam is all about how humanity's movement into space makes humans something we can't imagine. And so it makes sense that the alien race they encounter and the entire sort of thing that happens would also be something beyond our realm of perception. And then the challenge is to bring that into our realm of perception. And I think that's something this movie does very well that is the side of this that i felt consistently like compelled by and i think that's where you say like the kaiju format helps it because it is the there is no protagonist but the core of the movie is this prismatic view on this phenomenon happening and trying to understand it from all these angles and that side of it i think works um very well and it's something i want to watch again to sort of see like when i know where it ultimately goes how does it present the l's to us and all of that um yeah, it, it obviously, like, it, it feels quite... Like, this is not a Gundam movie with mobile suit battles. It's got battles with mobile suits in them, but there's never a point where two mobile suits go crazy against each other, right? Um, they are fighting very different things in this movie. Um, and so, I see what you mean, but I also think, like, you know, if... I, I feel like Gundam 00, because of how it sets itself up, is uniquely equipped to tackle the alien question. And then when they tackle it, this does feel like 
yeah, this is how Gundam would do it, and I like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and I think one important piece of context here for my experience is, Jonathan, you went into this movie knowing that this is the movie where alien shit happens in Gundam. Yes. I did not know that the first time I watched oh, wow. this movie. So when I watched this movie, I went in. The only thing I knew about it back fucking like six years ago when I watched this thing for the first time, the only thing I knew was I really liked this TV show and I knew that there was a movie and that the movie was a continuation and like a climax on the TV show. And that was it. I didn't know shit about there were aliens. I So like as soon as that started happening, I was like, what the fuck? Because yeah, good, like alien stuff is so not a part of Gundam and I think part of the reason why it feels that strong is because like alien stuff is so common in the broader mecha like genre um it's like very common um it's more common than what Gundam does even like in real robot stuff like Vodums is still Vodums isn't set on earth like oh, technically every character in Vodums is a fucking alien like Macross is all about a aliens Eva is basically about aliens because it's more what the, less what the angels are I mean that no that literally is what the angels are um, it's also what the Evas are. It's what everything is. Everything is an alien in Eva. Um, Depression oh. is the ultimate alien in yes. Eva. Um, but yeah, so it's like alien stuff is so common in the mecha genre. And so I think it's like, it's a particular thing that like it feels so kind of strange for it to, to touch Gundam because Gundam has stayed away from it, you know, at the time that this movie came out, like what, like... 30 fucking years basically uh 31 years uh and so yeah like it, it was like i really the first time i watched the movie just did not have the lens with which to kind of like process what it was doing um but yes like i do think like if you go in understanding part of what the premise of this movie is is effectively what if gundam does an alien like i think it is by far the best that this franchise could hope to do that like i don't think it's something that gundam should try often or maybe ever again um, but if like you're gonna do it, this is the way to do it, and yeah. And then if like this time when I went in understanding that that's what it is, knowing where it ends up and that kind of stuff, and like being able to put on that kaiju lens that like I realized like 15 into the movie minutes of the movie, it's like, wait, if you just took out all the Gundam characters and like halfway through the movie Godzilla shows up. And then instead of space battles, the aliens just land on Earth and all because you wouldn't have the budget to do space shit. But they land on Earth and then one of the aliens like becomes an evil Godzilla because it absorbs some of Godzilla. Like that's kind of just what the plot of Godzilla 2000 is. Um, like yes. it's like very <laughs> much in that same realm. It is very easy to imagine like taking this script as a foundation and removing about 50% of it and then changing that 50% to be a more specific kaiju movie and you could just make it. Um, like, it is so in that tradition, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, and I think that's probably what gives it the structure it does have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a an interesting movie, Sean. Where should we where, where should we take it? Uh, you know, actually, one thing I wanted to say, because you were on it, you... Um, okay, two thoughts I had while you were talking. Again. One, I want to commend you for making it through five hours of Gundam 00 podcast without spoiling that Setsuna becomes a metal boy. Oh, yeah. I don't know. That's like you making it through all of the original Gundam podcast without saying the word new type. I'm very <laughs> impressed. Yeah, I'm, you need to re-listen to all those original podcasts and just spot all the times I almost say the word new type and have to stop myself. And be like, hmm, this is a, like psychic bullshit hasn't happened yet in Gundam. Like, remember that, Jonathan? Remember when anything psychic had never happened in Gundam? How crazy yes. is that uh, to to remember that there was a time when psychic shit did, just didn't exist? Uh, I also wanted to respond to earlier in this conversation you brought up the just the ending with Marina, and I know we'll get there. But when I say, and I said this earlier in like my my opening statement, um, that this felt like the right ending, I think one way it just feels emotionally right is the very clear planned out structure of this series where. Season one ends with Setsuna writing a letter to Marina trying to express his feelings. And mm -hmm. season two ends with Marina writing a letter to Setsuna trying to express her feelings. And this movie, effectively part three, ends with them together not really having to say anything and understanding each other's feelings. Uh, it's just, it's, it is really clear, like, even as you're like gawking at like, holy crap, they went for it with crazy metal Setsuna. I would not have predicted that after episode one. It really does feel like this is a story they knew they were telling 
That's the word I've used in all of our Gundam 00 conversations very confidently that this is a Mm -hmm. show that started with purpose and ended with purpose and kept that purpose up. And it probably, it almost certainly went in directions you did not expect at the outset, but that does not mean they were not the organic directions that they always intended to go and did with with purpose and clarity. And that is a really cool thing for a a work that is honestly pretty sprawling. It's two seasons and a movie made over three or four years. That's a big thing to do this precisely, you know? Yeah, and and the fact that, like, it feels like it was always made with the understanding of it having this trajectory, right? That it starts very grounded, and then as it goes on, it spirals more into science fiction, um, and it gets, like, more and more out there. And that's part of what this movie is, is, like, I think if you're someone who was kind of put off by it getting a little bit more extreme in season two with the sci-fi stuff and the psychic stuff and a little bit more of like the kind of the melodrama soap opery kind of like character dynamics that season two engaged in a little bit more. Like, I think you're going to be put off by this movie because it is, you know, not with necessarily the soap opera stuff, um, but with the like that, the concept, the sci-fi stuff, it, like going away from this very grounded, we are just enmeshed in this very, powerful reflection of modern earth like geopolitics uh to ending with aliens and uh like you know what is i am convinced to this day the synthesis ending of mass effect 3 just like rips off the idea of like double a gun oh, right does that you you're know, right like, that's what fucking the mass effect i mean i'm sure it actually didn't i'm i don't know if the gun double uh, the mass effect people ever watched double a gundam but it is like this is like what the idea of the synthesis ending in mass effect 3 would be if like they could have gotten their head fully around, I think, what that concept was about. Um, yeah, this is a better Gundam, version of that, definitely. Yeah, Double Gundam executes that much more elegantly. And I like the ending of Mass Effect 3, but I think it's a lot messier than this. Um, but yeah, like that trajectory, it is if you really liked where you were and you didn't want to move, it might bum you out. And I sympathize with those people that just so much like the early Double Gundam stuff and didn't like that they moved away from that. But if you like the trajectory, I think it is like very precise Um, and it's so impressive, like you said, Jonathan, that like, it feels like it was planned or at least planned enough that they had all of those seeds planted early on to, you know, blossom in the ending quite literally with the flower, because all that imagery of flowers is all throughout that show, but you don't like, it's not as notable. Um, and it was one of the things I noticed, like when I rewatched it, knowing the flower imagery from the very end, that's like, oh, this stuff is all planted here all along like there's always this image of a flower like growing in the desert in Setsuna's flashbacks and stuff and they've been it's in the first that. scene of the show it's in the yeah. first theme song daybreak's bell i believe starts with that yeah so so it yeah. is this like symbol they have been building but they haven't drawn a lot of attention to it because it feels like they want they were waiting for this moment to say like now let's like really bring it to that level that we've been re- using some of this recurring symbolism and now let's like really bring the story to that place. Um, And to bring it to that place does mean that like the storytelling becomes more diffuse and more abstract, but it is able to do something that the TV show would not have been able to do with this more character focused storytelling approach. Yeah. And I think it's kind of like the show gets to have the best of all worlds because you get to do the very in-depth of the moment geopolitical stuff. But they also get to do something that is even more fundamentally Gundam, which are these bigger philosophical discussions about the purpose of humanity and our relationship to war and conflict and our relationship to each other. All these questions that are like on the mind of the show from moment one, right? And are always there. And I think because of the specific trajectory in that it starts very grounded and opens up, It never really loses that geopolitical sense. This movie does not deal with it much, although there is still, like, it lives in the DNA of the movie. Marina is a character trying to, like, find places for Middle Eastern refugees in this film, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a focus of this movie, but that is still something that informs it. And so what it is doing is is it is drawing very explicit connections between our current moment of politics and much more eternal, always evolving conversations about humanity... And I think doing that very gracefully over the course of the entire project that we now have full view of now that we've watched both seasons in the movie. Um, And that is something that just makes it feel like such a big, towering, special, unique Gundam work, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And man, you talk about the flower. Mm -hmm. The, there is definitely the, the moment, like, I was a little unsure of this movie in a lot of ways. And I said, like, my thoughts are unsettled. The moment where I was watching this movie and I went, I am so glad this exists. 
and this feels like the right ending, is when you see the flower in space. Mm-hmm. When you do that cut, and you have, I think it's you see all the characters that we know looking at it, and then you see what the ship has transformed into, and they make the absolute right call to drop the mic and cut to credits right then, and we'll do the final scene after the credits, but they need to let you digest that image because you just like the whole series just kind of snaps into place with that image. It's like the last little puzzle piece and it snaps into place and you see the full breadth of it. And I think you go, whether or not your thoughts on the movie are fully settled, mine still aren't, but you do go, I see the shape. This feels complete. And that's like one of the best things I can say for it. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, it's that thing where, um, I, I feel like you, that, that specific like sequence in terms of like its direction is, is like a pretty common, particularly in anime likes to do this of, of that. Here's like, we're going to cut to all the reactions and then we're going to cut to the thing that has like some like big symbolic, like something has happened. I feel like usually when shows try to do that, it is often not that effective because, because while you're looking at the reaction shots, you're imagining, well, what could it possibly be? to like elicit the react this reaction in all these characters and i feel like usually the actual reveal doesn't resonate because like the ground narr- like the narrative groundwork has not been laid for that symbol to carry the like implicit connotations it needs right because symbols don't need to be things that you can like understand on a like i can like break it down and like describe to you in a you know i'm an english teacher so it's like i don't need to write like the paragraph response or whatever to tell you what the fucking green light in the great gatsby means right if it's supposed to be an effective symbol it should be able to affect its narrative impact on you whether you can explain that narrative impact or not and i feel like a lot of times that requires narrative groundwork done within the story itself not things that you can assume like an assumed shared experience from an audience is just going to come in knowing that a flower should represent this for double Gundam or whatever. You have to set those ideas of symbols up within the narrative work itself. Um, and this is, I think, maybe the most successful version of one of those sequences I've seen where because they have been so thoughtful about it, even if you've not been picking it up consciously, they've been using this image of the flower to represent all these ideas about like the beauty of life, like the struggle of life of, of flower of this one lone flower in the desert, the single flower that felt gives a uh, Setsuna that still is alive, even though it's in space with him, right? Like this idea of life persisting um, in this beautiful, passive, peaceful way and life thriving on its own um, in the, the visage of a flower, like that symbol is so thoroughly established by the full preceding narrative that, yeah, like, but my jaw dropped, even though I knew it was coming. That was one of the other things I, I vaguely remembered was like the flower space station at the end. Um, but like my jaw still dropped when I saw it because I think it is such an effective like use of that technique in a way that I am talking about some symbolism stuff in my ninth grade class right now. And I really wish that they were all massive Gundam fans because this would be such a good example <laughs> to use um, rather than having to think of fucking like fairy tales or some bullshit. It's like, why can't we all have just like watched 50 episodes of Double O Gundam in the movie? Because then you all would understand what symbolism is because it's so good here. I would love if you just out of the blue showed your kids the last 10 minutes of Gundam Double O and see if like, now react, what does that symbol mean? And they would all just be like, are you okay, Mr. Chapman? <laughs> what like, happened? How could, why do you not understand what it means when the man shows up and now he's made of metal and kisses the blind old, or the hugs the blind older woman while the word murder machine turns into flowers? Like, come on, this is very easy stuff. <laughs> I love Gundam, Sean. This is one of those moments where I step back and I go, I love that this thing exists and we can make these jokes. It's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, God, oh man, you're talking about symbols. The Gundam as a symbol... Like, that's something we could make a whole podcast about, you know? Just, like, how has the Gundam been used as a symbol over the course of this series? And and I feel like Gundam 00 might be the richest vein of that in any Gundam show for, mm-hmm. like, how many visages the Gundam takes on and how many meanings it has. It is an angel to Setsuna. It is a god to Setsuna. It is a devil, in some cases, in the hands of certain characters. Um... It is a symbol of hope. It is a symbol of rebirth. It is a superhero. And in the end here, like it is this machine of death that becomes this literal flowering of life. It is something that can quantize and literally escape the physical boundaries. It is all these different things. And this is like, 
I, I love works where symbols are not fixed, you know, yeah. and a symbol can be multiple things. And I feel like Gundam 00, one of the things that makes it feel so fresh and, and like both of a piece with Gundam the series, but also free enough to play with Gundam the series is that the symbol of the Gundam means different things. Like Gundam Seed. I really like Gundam Seed. You really like Gundam Seed. The Gundam doesn't mean anything I think different than the Gundam typically means in Gundam Seed. Mm -hmm. Gundam 00 is really thinking about like what can the Gundam be and what can it mean um, and it's helped by having some of the best mobile suit designs in the series in that we have you know like 30 Gundams over the course of the show but we also have three for Setsuna and they are all fucking killer knockout designs but they all just grow to mean different things to you as a character or you as a viewer um, and and I really just truly love um that last image and that we end on the Gundam as a symbol and a transformed symbol. And what is more um, evocative of the arc of double O than having the last shot be the war machine that started all of this end by being in a field producing and blooming flowers from its body. Like that is, that is Gundam double O in a nutshell in one image. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's really powerful. Um, and it, it's also comes from, I think one of the other, Themes that's like a background theme in Double Gundam. I think this movie kind of puts it a little bit more in in the mind um, again. Is like this theme of like contradiction um, that also is like manifest in those symbols as well. Because as you're saying, Jonathan, like really a powerful use of symbolism is stuff that can, and that's part of what I was saying of like it's not something you need to be able to describe to someone for it to work on you because symbols. And this is true of, man, I feel like I'm just giving like the same speech <laughs> giving in my English classes. But symbols don't communicate people to people on literal levels. Like that's the de definition of what a symbol is, is that it communicates to, with you emotionally, not through language. Um, so, and that's true of stop signs as much as is true of the flower at the end of Double O Gundam. The reason why a stop sign, a red octagon, is an effective use of road signage is because you can spot it from a great distance away. And as soon as you see it, once you have learned the meaning of the symbol, you process it on an instinctual emotional level and feel the emotion of stop and you should be stopping, right? Um, and that's what a good symbols do is that they communicate with you on an emotional level. Good narrative symbols contain lots of different meanings. And oftentimes if it's really a powerful work, those meanings can be contradictory, but it still works because it's not literal because you're process processing it emotionally and emotions are self-contradictory. And so yeah. one of like, yeah, so one of the core elements of Double O Gundam that's been there since episode one, because they do a callback line with Graham Aker back to something he says in episode one in this movie, uh, is that celestial beings existence itself is contradictory, right? And which is to mean that like fighting to pursue peace or like using violence to create peace or to create like compassion and understanding between people is like an obvious like contradiction on its face and it, it is this thing that you we all struggle with is like how do you right it's that like meme of like how do you fight intolerance if you are a person who is tolerant of different viewpoints right it's like where do you draw these lines what does it mean to embody these virtues where do those virtues stop like and it's those contradictions of like no human being can be purely like tolerant of all things or you would be dead because you just be you tolerate your own fucking destruction right in the same way that you can't just sort of achieve the ideal of peace just by being passive and hoping for peace for people you do need to fight for it even if that fighting may cause more conflict um and that's sort of one of the core elements of this show is dealing with those contradictions um and i love that the con that contradiction embodied in the gundam Right, that the Gundam is both a devil and it's an angel, right? I mean, in the original Mobile Suit Gundam, that was one of its nicknames that Zeon had for it was the White Devil, because to them it was this thing that as soon as it showed up on the battlefield in the second half of that show, you knew that you were fucked because Amuro was killing every single person he saw. Um, but it also, to the other side, it saves lives. Um, and for Setsuna, it represents a, a saving angel. And then at the end, it finds that it's actually the fallen angel ribbons that is the one piloting it. Um, and so the Gundam is this thing that is this weapon meant to create peace, which is something that is a contradiction in and of itself. And I love the way that that ending embodies that vision through the the idea of the Gundam blossoming into flowers, that, that it can be both of these things in this narrative world, that it can be both this weapon 
but that also it can represent peace at the same time and it embodies that contradiction so powerfully. Absolutely. Um, you know, so our, our last episode, you, you mentioned this earlier, of the Weekly Stuff podcast, our other podcast, uh, Like, Listen, and Subscribe. Um, we did the, we talked about Godzilla vs. Kong and the other some other Godzilla movies and the previous legendary Godzilla movies. Um, and since that podcast came out, there was a piece by the critic Matt Zoller Sites in mm-hmm. Vulture um, about basically just t- talking about why he loves the legendary Monsterverse movies. And there's this passage in that piece, I would really recommend looking it up. Again, it's from the site Vulture, um, where he talks about how the legendary monster movies use the monsters as symbols and that the strength of it is that the symbols are multivalent and like one of the things that made Gareth Edwards original Godzilla movie so or not it's not the original Godzilla movie the original modern legendary movie from 2014 one of the things that I think touched people about it is that you can't exactly say what Godzilla is a symbol of in that movie because it changes depending on who's looking at him Mm -hmm. And he can be, he is a symbol of like the main character's dead dad. He is a symbol of nature. It is a, and and like nature, both its divine protective side and it's like wrathful, like Old Testament God side. Um, And that is something those movies employ very powerfully. And yeah, Gundam 00 gets it. I think the other, you know, Gundam show, we've probably talked about this the most with is Turn A Gundam, which I think gets this extraordinarily well with its main Gundam and like that is a major idea of that show in that uh, Lauren sees that as like this very benign nice you know it's a nice dude with a mustache it's this really nice thing but you know you have Corin Nander who who comes from the past and it is it is the nuclear bomb to him it is the apocalypse it is terror you know um and and that is that is something that Tomino is dealing very directly with there. And I love seeing you know a team that is disconnected from Tomino take it a step further here um and, you know, this is before we get to all the continuing religious illusions that we get here. And I think mm-hmm. this one, man, the the final flashback where you go back to uh, Olia Schuhenberg in, in like, a hundred years ago. And you have uh, Toru Furia as the boy who, like, becomes Ribbon's Allmark there. And so you basically have, like, you know, God and the, the angel who will become the devil, the angel Lucifer, like, in their heaven together in the, like, before times, in the Edenic times talking. And then you cut to, like, the all far other side of it in the future um you know it it this continues on from what we talked about in part two a lot of anime goes for its christian religious allegories and imagery some of it we think does it pretty clumsily like neon genesis evangelion some of it does it extraordinarily well and i think double o falls on the extremely well side of that um although i will say you know eva the thing eva does best and i think the reason eva endures is because it also understands the machines as symbols are multivalent um mm-hmm. and does that very well um but yeah this is it's such a rich thing to talk about and i do love how much of gundam double o you know in the other episodes sean we've at this point we would have been talking about all the characters in depth but this movie just gives you so much on that symbolic and visual level to talk about that's where we are 45 minutes in is still talking about this and it's great it's a very rich conversation yeah, yeah, because I I don't know if like there's really much of a point to break it down character by character because it's not with the you know there's a couple of characters like Setsu that we'll have to like address his specific arc, but like but yes, yes, like like the movie's not interested that much in the specific character arcs. It's interested in how do you construct a story to express these ideas. But yeah, yeah, but yeah, let's because I, I also want to hit on that scene at the end just because it does follow up from one of the main things we talked about last episode was season two of where season two like really brings all the religious symbolism and imagery to the forefront and yeah it is a thing i really appreciate because it is something that anime toys with all the time and i think eva is a pretty good example of it being a thing that like it's like vaguely evocative but it doesn't feel like it has anything underneath it with the christian imagery um because it just feels like you pulled some references to the Dead Sea Scrolls. You named things angels, and like you, you use the like words Genesis in the English language title, right? Like you pull some of like the the, the surface level elements of those images. But I don't think that show, outside of like a couple of things like Kaudu, um, in his arc, like is not that interested in really diving into what those things represent and what they mean, um, and like their narrative elements. And here, Double O Gundam is extremely interested in that, right? And it feels very well learned. Um, not to say that it's like this one-to-one allegory for fucking Paradise Lost or some shit. Um, but it is pulling on those elements so strongly um, that, yes, like, again, whether you are, like, aware of Christian mythological elements or not, like that scene with the Elia Schoenberg and, yeah, like, the the basis of Ribbon's Allmark, like, it, we, we, like, it reads so powerfully as this like the architect of the future explaining his vision of 
humans as this, you know, humans as a creature in that biblical sense that is capable of both good and evil and him trying to construct a pathway for humans to be able to to express the good side of it, right? To let the evil go back on earth and expand out into the heavens and only take the good parts with them, right? Um, as part of his vision of, of what he wants to build for them. Um, and yeah, like I think like those elements, um, you know, as someone who is not a Christian, but like I find those pieces of Christian mythology very compelling. I think this show like hits on those things really well. It's the kind of thing like if you like stuff like the book in the show is also pretty good good omens the neil gaiman and terry pratchett book uh, that got turned into an amazon show like it hits on a similar like the angel devil stuff and it hits like the similar ideas in a way that i think is very compelling even to people who are not super steeped in like that whole world and what's going on there um it's using that imagery and the substance behind it so effectively yeah, I mean, we're talking about mythologies here. You know, it, it, it's almost like your devoutness. That's not the purpose. We're talking about these yeah. as like myths and things that we build our understanding. Because myths are ways we process the world, right? That's how that's yeah. why they exist. Um, and so, yeah, it feels very true. Like, if you literally, if you were to try to, you know, read Gundam 00 and all the like Aeolia, I can never say his name, Mr. Schuhenberg stuff. Mm -hmm. If you were to, you know, try to do that in a very literal way and be like, tie him i don't know to steve jobs or something like it would be patently ridiculous right and you yeah. would say it's like weirdly patriarchal and all this stuff but you can't you you just can't that's not the point the point is a much more like he is distant and godlike and this one little flashback is the most extended look at him we get outside of the pi the first episode you know um that you know toru furia is as a voice is this thing that comes from the past and echoes through as this lucifer figure you know that's how you've you've kind of got to look at it and on that register it works very well yeah although now i am imagining alolia schuhenberg is like a steve jobs figure and instead his like statement in episode one of gundam double o he'd be wearing a turtleneck and walking around on stage with a laser pointer that'd be very different though yeah it'd be a different tv show but i'd, I'd watch that too and one more thing, no more war. Um, <laughs> yes. So I do want to, let's talk about the characters for just a little bit. Because I do, one thing I want to say is one thing I do like about, so like I said earlier, I think it, it goes a little overboard with trying to touch base with every character. And I think it uses some better than others. This is also a problem, by the way, the Full Metal Alchemist movie, also by Mitsushima, has the same problem. I assume when they give them the budget for the movie, someone at the studio, you know, kind of nudges them in the ribs and says... You do have to get all the fan favorite characters in. We want the applause moments in the theater. And I have seen Conqueror of Shambhala, the Full Metal Alchemist movie, in a theater. It gets the applause moments. It's very good at it. And I think this movie probably did the same thing. Um, the Japanese people don't really applaud during movies. But if it showed an American movie theater, it would get those, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what I do think is, in general, I think this movie is good at knowing whose character arcs are settled. And we're not going to disrupt that. And whose character arcs are a living thing, and we should further that. So Sumeragi is a settled character. I don't think we need a lot with her, and so she is there and she plays her role. But we don't need to like reopen that book because we we closed it. Uh, I think with Lock On Stratos is they do a great job with that of like Lock On uh, second Lock On uh, uh, Lyle Delandy has like so we talked about him in season two. He's so complete as a character. Uh, and I do love just the like little touches at the beginning here where you see he and Setsuna have formed a pretty tight friendship at this point, mm -hmm. And they are very much partners in what they do now with Celestial Being. And I do just love that side of it because I love the, their whole relationship together is great. You know, Alulia, Alleluia and Hallelujah have just come to a fun. They are, they call each other Ibo now and they, they are partners. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't need to reopen that book. Um, but Graham Aker, Mr. Bushido. His story is very unsettled. He was left in a place where he's transforming as a person. So you, you bring him back and you say, well, who is he now that he's taken the mask off? And he no longer goes by Mr. Bushido. And you see he has recommitted himself to be the man we saw in the beginning who is like a genuinely good captain who cares for his people and about doing the right thing. And he sees sight of that again. Um, and he is he goes from almost you know committing seppuku for no good reason at the end of the TV show to happily dying for the best reason he can imagine, you know? And great arc for that character that, like, makes me like Mr. Bushido even more than I already did. Phenomenal. Um, and then, of course, Setsuna is, I think, the most obvious example of that, who his character arc feels settled, I think, by the end of the TV show, but you come back to the movie and it makes sense. Oh, this dude evolved into an innovator and he's the only one. 
yeah, he probably has some shit going on, and we're mm-hmm. going to further that. And so I think the movie is pretty smart about all those things. Yeah, no, I think it does use its characters well. Um, I think it uses them generally efficiently. Because I would also add, like, because I know you said that you wish that there was, like, more for them in the movie, but I think I would kind of put them in this pile of, like, settled characters is Saji and Louise. Yeah. They also mostly use as, like, a way to um, dramatize some of, like, the early invasion stuff and to bring Setsuna in contact with um, the aliens for the first time that take on the form of ribbons or at least a ribbons type innovate or whatever that was like on the station in Jupiter. Um, but other than that, like they're basically settled, right? Like it, it right. is there, they are like witnesses with everybody else and they use them kind of as like your civilian POV for a couple of moments. Um, but like, I think it is also smart that they don't try to open that up too much more because I think it would like complicate things so much. Yeah. It, that makes sense. Um, when you put it in my own framing, <laughs> I think you uh, you're right. Um, I, I guess what I I guess the only thing that like and it's again it's something where I need to watch the movie again. I think it's because Saji is the closest thing we have to an actual POV character in the show. That felt mm-hmm. like a little bit of a disconnect, but that's okay. The movie is its own thing, and I think you're right. I and I do like seeing the like grown up Saji and the life he's leading and like seeing Luis and that they, they acknowledge like she wouldn't just be back to normal after what happened in the show. That's all good. Um, and yeah, and I think like the moment that probably sells it for me with all of this and all these characters is the big musical montage near the end Mm -hmm. where you have Setsuna jumping between everybody and seeing them all. And so you see Saji out there on the space station working and he sees all of his, you know, companions in the battlefield and even some of his enemies. Um, And I think you feel like everyone is sort of in the right place for where they need to be. Yes. Yeah. That I think it uses those characters effectively. Yes. And for Saji specifically, I do really love when you see him and it's like, it, it highlights how much his character has grown, right? That he, like, voluntarily runs out there to go help, like, on that space station they're on. And, like, he's repairing or whatever, like, the hole. And he's helping them out and, like, going out there and putting himself in danger and risking his life for other people. Um, and, yeah, and just, like, getting that. You see, you know, part of that is, like, Setsuna like getting to see the impact he's had on other people's lives. But then also that's, like, there are all these relationships and people are connected um, and he sort of like refines himself in those relationships um, with all these people that he knows. Yeah, I think that, that that dynamic that they use the characters for is very powerful. Because it's kind of funny when when we first meet or when Setsuna first meets Saji and Luis here, and and they have the fight with the the metal ribbons all mark. I was totally expecting he would like take Saji and Luis back to the ship with him and be like, "You'll be safer with us in space," because that would just make sense. That's where they had been before all this stuff. And instead, he leaves them there, and they wind up being completely separate from him for the rest of the movie. And at first, I thought, that's kind of a messy storytelling choice. And then I think when you see the thing at the end of, like, okay, but Saji is in his, like, natural habitat, and then he chooses to do the the go into space and fight, right? Yeah. Um, and Setsuna gets to see that and see how those connections exist, even when he is not in the proximate physical space of, of uh, Saji that's when it hits. And so I think it's absolutely the right choice. So I'm talking myself into, actually, I think it uses Saji and Louise pretty well. Yep. Uh, even though, I think I do think there's a general dearth of good use of female characters in this movie. Like, mm-hmm. Louise is mostly screaming over the, the L's in her head. Sumeragi is kind of backgrounded. Um, Felt is probably the most dynamic, but Felt does have at least 90% of her dialogue is looking at Setsuna and saying, Setsuna. Yeah, she, and that's yeah like, she gets Rolina a little bit for sure. Yes. Um, she still gets some goods. I think they like, there's an upswing with her at the very end of the movie. Um, but yeah, that's, she does get a little Rolina. Um, but yeah, overall, it's, it's good. Marie kicks some fucking ass in this movie. I do like Marie in the background. Just, she is, she is herself. She and Alleluia are a good team. I love that they're always like, they just, they own that Gundam together and they do their shit together. It's, that's, that's a good dynamic. Yeah, I particularly like with them that when they launch, for like the last fight that you know he say says like you know alia haptism and uh soma purus launching and that he's still like i like that it's even though you don't spend that much time like addressing it like because they don't you know marie and soma don't have the like we're two voices in the same head talking to each other thing that alia has with hallelujah they're still clear that like their identities it's not like one of them has taken over for the other it's like they're like a fused entity 
that it's she's both Marie and some of yours at the same time. Like I like that like subtle um yeah. kind of distinction they make. It's a very good, clear understanding of character. Um, speaking of Saji, because I don't know where else we're going to talk about this, I do love Saji's introduction to the movie, which is watching yes. a movie version of the events of the end of Gundam Double O. Um, it's like the beginning of the fucking third Austin Powers movie, where you have the Hollywood version of Austin Powers being made with like Tom Cruise, but this time it's it's in the Gundam verse. It's like a a heightened anime version of what is already a heightened anime. It is very funny, just as a little parody of like how Gundam actually exists in the world. I enjoyed that a whole hell of a lot. Yes, yeah, though that is a great scene because, yeah, it's basically like, what if you turned, what if you fused the ending of Char's Counterattack, the ending of season one of Double Gundam, and the ending of season two of Double Gundam into a, like, super robot show, you know, Voltron <laughs> style or whatever. Um, That's basically what that movie is. Like, they have, it's a great cameo by, uh like, one-time petty villain Alejandro Cross in his big dumb golden mobile suit from the end of the first season where it almost feels like they picked that shit so that they could make fun of it in this movie yes um and yes and I I love that so much my favorite shot is when they have the like um like the full team shot where all four of the fake uh Gundam Meisters like cut in and you see like they have someone who's like it like vaguely looks like Setsuna, like if it was Captain Harlock from if people know what Captain Harlock is, another like manga anime series of the you know, he's got like a scar. I think he, I don't know if he I love he's got has, the scar on his face, it's great. Yeah, he's got the scar. I don't know if he actually has an eye patch, but he definitely has like his hair over one of his eyes and has like that whole like dramatic look. Um, and then like the other three are just completely off base, including one of them that looks like she's like a, like a, it's like, like, it's like a 12 year old girl or something instead of Alleluia. And it's like, this is very good. This is very well, It looked funny. like, I thought it was supposed to be like Nina Trinity is what it looked like. Like sure. just a totally mixed up detail. It's a girl with pink hair. It's great. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just very, it's a very funny scene. And then the other part I like about it is like, I, I, I won because so this movie, if you have not seen the TV show, would be completely unwatchable. Like there's no way right. you'd be able to make any sense of anything because it just does not bother to introduce the characters to you, which is, I think, the right choice because it, this movie would end up being like two and a half to three hours long if it had to do all of that, too. Um, so But I do like that it, it just like throws this vague random bone at the beginning of the movie of like, if here's here's what got us to the, the celestial beings, a thing. And there are some people, it's like, I love the idea of imagining, you know, you were someone who really loved Double O Gundam, and, but you had a friend who had never seen it, and you're like, oh, well, I want to go watch the movie, and they're like, oh, sure, I'll watch it with you, I haven't really seen the TV show. And just imagining someone who has not seen the source material watching this movie, and that, because that is the moment where movies do the, and here's like the little thing that kind of reintroduces you into the universe that will give a new audience member the bare essentials, and it's like, you would not be able to uh, go very far into this movie with the essentials that they give you in that little intro scene. Nope. <laughs> yeah, that would be funny. I also love Saji sitting there with his friend, and Saji being like, I was there, it didn't happen like this, and the friend just being like, oh man, this is crazy, and the friend doesn't know that Saji was there for what is being depicted. It's great. Yes, yeah, I like, like, he, like, very quietly says, like, I think they glorified it a little bit. <laughs> the guy's <laughs> like, well, don't, all, don't all movies do that? He's like, yeah, sure, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. <laughs> oh, it's great. Okay, where where do you want to take this next, Sean? Um, let's, let's talk about Cessna, I guess. Let's talk about our, our, our protag, our, our Gundam boy. Gundam our metal boy. boy. To be, yeah, our metal boy, our metal Gundam boy. Yeah. So, yeah, so Setsuna, um, so, you know, they, they do an interesting thing here where, and I think felt like they, they sort of narrativize it. They pull it into the narrative that, like, Setsuna feels like he's almost kind of regressed as a character in a way, that he is more standoffish and aloof in the way that he was in a lot of season one, only now, of course, it's for a different reason. So he is the, our one innovator, and it's kind of like, it feels like they're pulling some of that material from the end of the original Mobile Suit Gundam with Amuro, Whereas Amuro grows more into his new typeness, he ends up kind of pushing all of his friends away because he's different and he feels weird things and he can sense stuff before it happens and he's kind of like spacing out in weird moments. Um, and so that's kind of where we meet Setsuna at the beginning. And I kind of remember the first time I watched the movie being a little bit disappointed by that because I think when I didn't know where the movie was going... I feel like this is something that a lot of movies based on TV shows end up doing is they end up 
resetting characters to like the most iconic point in their character development rather than continuing off from like where you feel like you left them. Um, and so I remember being kind of annoyed by it first time I watched the movie. And then on rewatching it, I think it's such a powerful choice because one, it does narratively make sense that he is the only innovator. He is kind of alone in this stuff and he's kind of lost sight of all of that. But when you know that's like, that's what the movie is about is it is about this like big dramatization of kind of in some ways a like really core condensed version of and symbolic version of what you saw in a more protracted character development kind of way for Setsuna in the TV show. And here it's a lot of those same ideas, but expressed in this much more kind of um, artistic, -y, emotional, symbolic manner where he starts the movie. And I love this moment where I didn't think much of it or I wouldn't have thought much of it the first time I watched the movie, but it's really good um like kind of script writing and in sort of like narrative pacing is your introduction to sets into this movie is this little armed intervention he and lock on make as uh marina and her crew are attacked by the colonist people because they're trying to get their refugees back who were displaced forcibly by the previous administration to work on these colonies and so they're trying to give them passage back to their home in the middle east and then the, the colony corporation attacks them. Um, and so then Lock on Stratus comes out of nowhere and Setson is piloting the ship. And Lock on says, like, hey, do you want to say hello? And Setson is like, no, we don't need to do that. And he just leaves and goes back to um, the Ptolemaeus. And that scene, I think the first time you watch it, it only registers as like, here's your reintroduction to the characters. You like kind of know what to sort of expect. It feels like it's maybe set up to reintroduce Marina. Um, and to sort of establish that this is what Celestial Being has been doing in the meantime, that they are doing armed interventions, but they're doing them kind of on the sly or on the down low, right? We're not advertising big Gundam stuff. We're doing little ones here and there predicted by Veda. But really what it's doing is setting up the ending of the movie, right? You're getting your starting point, your temperature check on Setsuna, that Setsuna is so fixated on his own bullshit that he can't see this like, he should be reaching out to the people around him, right? That's like, he has fought hard and won this piece and he should be using that opportunity to connect to the people that he cares about and cares about him. But instead he does this very sets in a thing of very coldly saying, no, we don't need to do that. Let's just go. Um, and I love that contrast of him there compared to sets at the end of the movie after his revelation in the, his vision he has and him embracing felt to him embracing Maria at the end of the movie. I think it's like a very effective kind of circular storytelling thing they do there. I agree. And and actually, you know, I was prepared when I sort of saw this direction. I was like, hmm, is this, I had the same thought you were describing there of like on a first viewing, is this working? But I was actually sold on it pretty quickly. And I think it's a couple of subtle things. I think part of it is that even as he has quote unquote regressed, the way Mamoru Miyano plays it vocally mm -hmm. sounds like Setsuna evolved. Like every, like even when he's like kind of closed off, like when there's several moments where people are asking him like what's going on, he's like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm feeling. I don't know why I'm not attacking these aliens. Just like the way he says it, he is more, he's using like the kind of vocal qualities of the more adult communicative Setsuna. Setsuna is not closed off because he like hates these people and any of that. Like it's it's because he doesn't understand his own feelings. So it feels like it's it's quiet, but it's a more mature kind of quiet than little boy sets in a had in season one. Mm -hmm. I also think there are moments like I talked a lot about this in our season two podcast. At the end of that show, he feels like the leader of celestial being. He still does in this show. Yes. Like when he comes on the bridge and he talks, everyone listens. And there are several moments where he kind of like throws out an order and then they do it. And so it feels like he has changed, but not regressed. Like his character is progressing this phase of his character is more like quiet and reserved, but not to me feeling like in the way he was when we meet him in season one. This feels like an extension of season two Setsuna. Um, I think the character design helps with that too. Um, I do think it's pretty cool that this is a show where you have to do like three character designs for all the main characters because they all age up over the course of things. I guess Lock On never looks that different, but like Setsuna has three very distinct phases. Um, I think Alleluia, they age up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, Alleluia has Saji. that. He, Alleluia went with the ponytail. He's got a ponytail yes. for this movie instead of all the long hair. <laughs> and then, yes, yeah, Saji, like, it's particularly it's Setsuna and Saji have, like, the most dramatic, right. like, it is that thing where you look at them as, like, especially because they do 
in the flashback you see or not a flashback but the vision you see little kid sets again and you get that yeah. direct contrast of like right fuck holy shit like he's he's like a grown man now right he's he's in his early 20s um so it's it's yeah that like progress where you're so just accustomed to watching a bunch of 14 year olds all the time in Gundam that it is very nice to see this as like no he's grown up like he's an adult like he's you know he's Amaro in Zeta or as far as counterattack you get a little bit more of that that feeling from him um and yes and then a lot of that does also come down to uh, Miano's like really expert performance that he finds a slightly different like space for, I feel like for the voice to sit um so yeah that even when he's being more standoffish it's always clear to the audience that it is for different reasons um that he is processing things and he's dealing with different things than he did when he was standoffish in season one his you know care for the people around him still shines through in a way mm -hmm. where you know, season one, Setsuna, if Alleluia got blown up in front of him, I don't know. He's too emotionally broken to care about that. You never doubt that that is something he would move heaven and earth to stop in the movie, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Setsuna, still a great Gundam character, one of the best Gundam boys, and the only metal Gundam boy. Yes. He's, man, he's he's my boy. Yeah, I, I, I adore him as a protagonist. So, Should we so talk about... Yeah. Speaking of metal, let's. Should we just talk more about the L's and and how they are introduced and used mm -hmm. throughout this movie? Yeah. So I love this shit so fucking much. It's just such. It's not you know a purely original alien concept. Like I said, it's it's somewhat similar to stuff you see in Godzilla two thousand. It's obviously a little bit inspired by the T one thousand as well. Um, you know your whole liquid metal thing. Um, but I I love two things about them. One is I just think like as a creature it serves as such a potent metaphor for everything that the show is dealing with, with trying to understand each other of like destroying each other in your attempt to understand one another. It's reflection of the things that comes into contact with. Um, it's like pure alienness, right? That it's not, you know, and especially since it's anime, it's much easier to do it this way than if you're doing this, the live action thing would be insanely expensive to do. So that's one of the reasons why I'm live action, just like paint someone green and they're an alien and you're good. Or you put like a puppet, um, here you have this utterly alien concept of a race um, that lives in the heart of gas giants. I love that they are, they're not originally from Jupiter, but they're from a Jupiter-esque planet. And so they went here and ended up here and are living in Jupiter. And so that's just a cool alien concept that's like they don't even live on like terrestrial planets. Um, they are so far outside the concept of what we would normally consider to be life. Um, and so all that is rad. The other thing I love about them is what they allow to do for in terms of action. It feels like something that they, you know, they could not have done this on the TV show just purely from a budgetary standpoint. There's so much complexity in what happens in the action scenes. There's so much movement happening all the time because of the sheer volume of these uh, things and how many different shapes and forms they take. It is something that just like feels expensive in terms of animation budget while you're watching it because it just it seems it's the kind of thing that like you can't reuse stuff or can find like a lot of, use a lot of like your cheap kind of outs that animation uses all the time to sort of like make things easier. Here, this feels like something that on a TV budget, a lot of these action scenes, it just would not have been feasible. Um, and so it feels like they are using the full range of their movie budget to achieve a concept that like you just would not have been able to do anything like this uh, on a TV, on the TV version. Uh, absolutely. It's so good. Um, I... <laughs> I, and there's kind of multiple phases of it, right? So you have when they're like just rocks at the beginning. And sometimes they're rocks that like spurt out of people. But you're not sure what more they are than that. You have the entire phase where they are just literally invisible. And controlling like the... Not controlling the cars. They are becoming the cars we come to learn. But we don't know are these like... Like at first, this, I just knew there were aliens. I didn't know what form they were going to take. And at first I was wondering like, can we not see them? And that's why they're like driving the cars. And so you get some very fun inventive action sequences like Alleluia and Marie's introduction to the movie basically is them being chased by those cars and there's some really good stuff there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as it goes along, like every, basically every space battle in this movie is more visually ambitious than the one before it as the L's are like introduced to us and they take on more forms and they do more shit. Um, and yeah, it's, 
I like what you said about it being something that feels like movie esque. I love that they picked something like that that very c- firmly distinguishes this as a movie. You could not do this on the TV show, even a TV show as phenomenally well animated as Gundam Double O, and that is what you know makes this feel like the the movie theatrical. This is this would be very cool to go see in a theater, you know. Yeah, because you just have in that last fight, you just have some of those like cuts that are unfucking believable. Where yeah, you have yeah. like. I think maybe my favorite one is Alleluia, like, flying his ship as, like, the whole train of the elves is following him, and he's just firing missiles behind him, and so it's just this explosion of lights, um, it's, and yeah, there's just a lot of really powerful, like, frenetic movement, um, and yeah, it just feels like they they just fucking I, go hardcore on just animating every little detail of like the undulating surfaces and the elves as they like shift and they transform into things and the massive volume of them. It's, it's just really, really phenomenal stuff. That's great. I love that cut you talked about. I feel like all of the shield bits on lock ons Gundam, they were mm-hmm. made for this as yeah. cool as they were in the series. They were made for fighting these fucking elves because they are used so well. He basically has the same kind of wings that, um, Amuro has, uh, in, uh, in, in the, with the Gundam, ne- uh, what's it called? The new the, Gundam. The new Gundam in, uh, in, in Shara's counterattack and is using those and they look so cool. Uh, I think this uses CGI really well, yeah. um, because CGI in anime is a fraught topic that we will not solve today, um, because that's a much bigger discussion. We will um, talk about that in, with Kimetsu no Yaiba uh, when we do that podcast. We'll talk about how you use digital stuff in animation, uh, phenomenally well. Yes, no, it's it's a really big discussion and there's a lot to go into here. Um, but something that I think Gundam 00 makes the right choice on is that they where they use the CGI is for like the L's like when they are being like liquid metal and like consuming things. And it's a perfect use of CGI. It is not one of those like take you out of the movie, this is like rendering at a low grade that today in 2021 we wouldn't use. Because of the kind of surface it's doing, it's a timeless use of CGI. It's something that you couldn't do by hand. It doesn't really need texture, so it doesn't have to be good CGI. It just has to move right on the images. And so it's integrated very, very well. Like, the the kind of... I'm going to... I will introduce this when we do our Kometsu no Yaiba podcast. There's a theory that a scholar has of animatic versus cinematic movement and these are like two different spaces anime can use and cgi and live action stuff moves more towards the cinematic and it's about depth um gundam double is still 100 percent on the more animatic side of things where it's more about the kind of flat side compositional view um but the cgi is integrated into that extraordinarily well um and just again gives you this sense of of the the true alienness of these things we're looking at yeah, absolutely. It's utterly phenomenal. Um, I, it's just such a creative, interesting, compelling kind of enemy. And especially like, you know, doing this podcast, you know, we talk about like Gundam on Gundam fights all the time because it's what most of the action scenes are. But I love that like the only other action sequence that I can think of in the all of Gundam that is even similar to the stuff you see in this movie is the ending of Gundam F91 and the bugs from F91, which feel like whether it's a direct inspiration or not, it's a similar concept of this like a noble kind of grossly alien, you know, they're machines, but they're, they feel like sadistic in their intelligence of the bugs in F91. And it's just this massive swarm and con- quantity of them is the danger. It's the only other time Gundam has ever done this kind of action scene. Um, so it just feels so fresh to see it when I love the action yeah. Gundam all the time. But you get to know the pace and the style and, like, the structure of those mobile suit fights. Here, it feels like they're doing stuff that's just totally different. Yes, and I'm glad you brought up F91 because that's one of my favorite action scenes in all of Gundam is the stuff with the bugs at the end of F91. And this has that similar quality of you're not really fighting the bugs. You're, like, running from them. You are trying to survive. And you're trying to do something that will make them destroy themselves, almost. And so most of the action in this movie is so frenetic because it's not like there's a thing they are directly firing at and punching. It is this infinity of things. You knock one head down, seven heads will emerge. You are running from them. You are trying to, like, get them to hit each other and blow up. There's all sorts of strategies the different Gundam Meisters and other pilots like Graham Aker are trying to use to, like, fight these things. You have, like, 
I, I know we hate Andre and he's a stupid douchebag, but the scene where he dies is like really cool in its mm-hmm. animation. And like, it is just this, like he has to use the trans am to just like cut this thing apart. And it winds up killing him because he has to get too close. And it, it, you know, integrates with him and all of that. Um, so it's yeah, it's very very unique. It looks like nothing in Gundam Double O, but it also looks like nothing in Gundam in general, other than that F ninety one thing. And as our third Gundam movie, this also means it's not trying like you can't top the action in Char's Counterattack in F ninety one. I'm sorry, it does not matter how big a budget you have, how great the digital animation tools are, the storyboarding and the cuts and the animation quality is just too good in those movies to ever top. So if you're making the next Gundam movie, don't. Do something different, and they do. This doesn't have action remotely like those movies, really, other than the sense, I think, there is a certain sense, like in Char's Counterattack, of just the sheer scale of the battle going on here, but it's a completely different kind of battle. Uh, and so it doesn't, you're not watching this comparing it to other Gundam things, which is always, I mean, fuck, this, is, this was the 31st anniversary of the show. It is hard to make a Gundam thing where you're not watching it comparing it to five other Gundam things, and they find a way to do it. Yeah. Um, because then the other thing with like that visual element with the else um, that I love is that they um, it's near the end like the grandiosity of them is so powerful and that's like some of the most gorgeous stuff in this movie like that sequence where the like massive sphere like their ship or like the core because it's yes. also like because I feel like you don't even at the end of the movie really fully understand what they are as like a life form is it a hive mind do they have individuality like what are they really so it's like, I don't know what that giant sphere is uh, to the else, but that rising out of the red eye, the like the, the giant storm on Jupiter, um, it is like just one of the coolest fucking things I've ever seen in an anime. Like it's such a gorgeous shot. And the just the fucking clouds of else that like with like beams shooting through them and the clouds di- dispersing like they're fluid or they're made of like vapor. Um, there's just the the immensity of it. Um, and this almost like they look like nebula or something, you know, this this like very sort of um, primal, like early universe kind of imagery that they use to represent them almost, uh, I think is just so evocative and so striking. Absolutely. Uh, I also I love and I applaud that they keep up the Jupiter stuff because there's mm-hmm. a long history in Gundam from Zeta Gundam and our boy Paptima Shiroko that weird shit comes from Jupiter. And you get it there, and you get it in Gundam F91, and Crossbone Gundam gives it to you good, because Jupiter gets its full moment in the sun in Crossbone Gundam, which, yes, we will talk about one day. Um, And then you get it here. I just love that they go to, like, yes, if there is something weird and unexplainable, it does, in fact, come from Jupiter. Uh, And so here you go. It happens again. And honestly, this is maybe the best in terms of just pure images, Jupiter stuff that Gundam has ever done. I agree with you about that moment where it's coming out of the red spot on Jupiter. When you have like the moons of Jupiter, like Io getting sucked into it and the rings are like detaching and collapsing. Oh, it is so fucking cool. Yeah. And, and I do, Jonathan, I have to correct you a little bit because you said the weird stuff from Jupiter starts with Zeta Gundam. It does not. It starts with the original Gundam because that's where my boy Shalia Bull the new type, Shelly Abol. Right! He is from Jupiter. So it goes back all the way to the fucking <laughs> tap, baby. Uh, it is it is weird shit is out in Jupiter. And yes, this is, for me, this is the best weird shit in Jupiter. Like, maybe in, like, science fiction. Like, Jupiter's, like, a really, I think, like, aesthetically interesting planet. Like, you know, it's the biggest planet in, in our solar system, obviously. But it's just, like, the swirling storms of the surface, the surface of Jupiter... Um, it's just such a, like, I think, like, artistically interesting looking planet to me. But all of our aliens always come from fucking Mars. And it's like Mars is a big red dead rock. Um, Jupiter just, it feels so much more mysterious. Um, and yeah, like, just like the notion that there are, there's this, like, hive of, like, synthetic or, I don't know, like, silicon based, whatever, like, these, like, crystalline life forms living deep under the surface of a gas giant planet. Like, that's just a fucking sick concept um, that just lends to this really beautiful science fiction imagery that they have. Yeah, absolutely. The I do think when I, like, really started to turn on the movie and was on the edge of my seat, like, I need to see how this plays out was when the Jupiter stuff starts and you see the planet and, oh, God, it's so good. Yes. Um, yeah. But let's let's back up a little bit and talk because that was the one of the things I liked about the else was you know that that sort of the visual component they have, but let's also talk about like the else as like 
you know, going back to our symbolism stuff and, and what it represents, um, the L says like this sort of the kaiju of our kaiju movie and what it kind of says about humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's the obvious level of symbolism of they are bonding two things and they are trying to understand through destruction. And that is, of course, a heightened version of what Double O is about, you know, throughout its run. Um, but then they are also, you know, completely alien and foreign within that. And the process of understanding becomes inherently violent. And that is also part of what Double O is about. Um so, but but you probably have more formed thoughts on this, Sean, because you've actually seen this twice and lived with it. Mm -hmm. um, for me, a lot of it is just, you know, so much of like the first hour of this movie, especially, is just keeping up with like what these things are. And I think you, it's part of the thing about this movie that I still have questions about its pacing, I think, because I think maybe it takes a little too long to kind of kick you into the t sense of like, read these things symbolically, please. Um and and but but again, I don't know if I would feel that if I saw it a second time. So yeah, yeah, because I guess like because one of the things that they do is I think they hit on the like humanity's like reliance on like the technology piece, right? So they start out as emulating pieces of technology like cars and trucks, and then over the course of the movie, as humanity wraps ramps up their military response to the else, the else absorb and become the military you use to fight them right so it becomes this like very direct metaphor for you know violence begets violence right that like your armed response is going to incur an equivalent response from whoever you are fighting as specifically with the else so that sequence at the end of the movie where they have been these like shapeless kind of forms for a lot of the movie or they like turn into like vaguely alien looking ships or like missiles almost and then they and then they start absorbing our missiles and start turning into like what looks like human missiles um and then at the end in that big fight they start turning into mobile suits and then they start turning into capital ships um and they start becoming exactly our military response and i think that that like direct like confrontation with like weapons technology and military technology as this thing that because this is what we give them it's what they become and so it reflects on the like violent instincts of humanity and it's like one of the reasons why i think when you know looking at the first encounter that setsuna has with them i suspect that that's like one of the reasons why setsuna doesn't know how to respond to them is because he knows like in his bones as an innovator like he understands the more violence we use against them, the more violence they're going to give back to us. It's like the more we put into them, the more they're going to put back out to us. So we need to figure out a different way to resolve this conflict. Um, and he can't figure it out until the end of the movie. But that reflective quality of them, I think, is like really powerful at delivering that theme that is a part of Double O Gundam. But I think it's just like generally like with Gundam's interest in the way that the advancement of military technology creates an advancement in like militaristic desires and violence and the destruction caused by war and conflict. There's an interesting thread at the beginning of this movie that sort of gets dropped for obvious reasons, but you have the president of the Federation having conversations about this like sort of extremist group out in space that we see Marina fighting against, you know, um, and you have that failed assassination attempt that, that celestial being stops and, and they use the word conciliation. They are having a conciliatory policy towards them of like, they are trying to stop the violence, but not by enacting violence on them specifically. And that is sort of a preview of everything that is to come because what Marina does in that first scene where she like has the gun on her but tries to talk the gunman down and after lock on comes in and saves her she still goes over to him and tries to like give him peace and understanding and empathy that is a little synecdoche of what mm. the actual right way to deal with the um with the else is right and that is ultimately to me why marina and setsna are able to have their moment of understanding at the end of the film because they ultimately wound up taking the same approach. Uh, yeah. He does it on a much bigger, more metaphysical scale in the end, but it's the same idea they are both having there. And you see the government having this discomfort with a conciliation policy because they don't 
for understandable reasons. Like, what would that look like politically is a giant question, right? Um, and like what tools, you know, if you have a toolbox with a hammer and nails, you're going to see things as things to be nailed into, you know? Um, and so this is, it's only been two years. The entire world hasn't changed that much. They're trying to figure this out. And when push comes to shove and they meet the aliens, eh, the conciliation policy goes out the window pretty quick. It becomes a fight or flight response. And it's something I really like in this movie. There is not a villainous human character in this movie. There is not the person, sometimes kaiju movie do this, mm -hmm. where you have the dumbass in the corner who's like, if we just fire enough nukes, we'll be okay. And they fuck up everything because they're firing too many nukes. Nobody looks stupid or unreasonable in this movie. Like, you know, you have, like, one of your main militaristic characters fighting the L's is Caddy Mannequin, who we know is a good person and, like, does is in things for the right reasons and sometimes was on the wrong side. But, you know, she made the right decisions by the end of that show and helped everyone out. And she is in this for the right reasons. And the movie is not condemning her for wanting to fight the L's. Because it knows that's a very reasonable human thing to think that if this thing is coming in and tearing bodies apart with all this metal stuff, that you will have that fight or flight response of we have to fight back. And so Setsuna's transformation beyond the human is really that transformation beyond those basic instincts, right? That transformation beyond seeing things as enemies to be fought and trying for something completely different at the end of this movie. And that's what being an innovator ultimately is and ultimately means it is look th their their word choice is not subtle here it is an innovation yeah. to be able to do radically what humans are clumsily trying to do at the beginning of this movie which is peace and conciliation which does not come natural to us not because we are inherently bad but for reasons that we understand and empathize with. The movie is not judgment. Like, that's part of why the movie has an interesting view of humanity, is it is not a nihilistic view of humanity there, but it is a view of where, you know, what are the things that hold us back and what are the innovations that we need to make to actually have these kinds of peace and understanding. And that's what this movie is actualizing through through all of this. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things it then does using all of that is it the other thing that like the elves function as which is this is your like very standard kaiju construction is that the kaiju is some represents or embodies in some way for much of the movie a like monstrous version of the thing that the protagonist is struggling with right or it has to confront in like that side of the film and so for setsuna setsuna's whole arc in the movie is trying to like understand things um, and he's he's pursuing it really doggedly at the same time forgetting all the people around him, right? And so that's part of his relationship with Felt is that Felt is very earnestly trying to build a connection with Setsuna and Setsuna is just sort of coldly blocking that out because he's just sort of blind to it even though he's supposed to be the person who is seeking out that empathy and seeking out that kind of connection. He can't see it because he's too focused on these bigger picture ideas and so then when confronted with the Els and him trying to understand them, they are this monstrous version of like, they're so far outside his realm of understanding, right? That like literally the amount of information he receives in trying to empathize with them, like damages his brain because they are this unknowable alien life form that like they have a hive mind or whatever it is. Um, There's so much to what they are that he as a single human can't even really process um and so yeah like they represent that in that moment where he confronts them in the middle of the movie and is sort of turned comatose is this inability to understand made manifest as a monster that then he is only able to overcome them because then he has this revelation of that there are these people out here that he has made these connections he has touched saji's life and lock on's life in marina's life and then he's also then holds felt's hand um, and reaches out to the the flower she gives him in his his vision. Um, and so, yeah, that's the other, like, really, I think, effective thing that the elves come to function in the plot is they actualize Setsuna's character arc by becoming this external, exaggerated version of it. That scene is so good, where he is in the coma, and he has this whole flash of his entire life from being a kid killing his parents on through all of these major moments you have once again we see the old lock on stratos um neil delandy uh neil and lyle our, our boys yep um you know saying the line about you have to change and i love that that line still has meaning in this movie because that change you know i like that the change he makes in the show is 
ultimately not the one. Like, there's more to it. There's what you do with that change, which is what this movie is in the next step of that story, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a great sequence. And I think even if Felt does get a little marinad uh, or relinad in, um, you know, saying Setsuna so many times, um, the moment where, you know, she's got his hand and he reaches out for her. and It's beautiful. It's perfect. It's like, it's such a great payoff to this character who has been around the entire series and this sort of subtle relationship with Setsuna that has built up. Um, extremely well done. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it is one of the best parts of the movie. And that's where you also get the the insert song. Uh, yes. Like, basically, nothing is scary anymore. Like, Mo Nani Mo Kwaku and I. Um, by Chiaki Ishikawa, who did one of the other songs. I don't remember which one she did from... Double she did Yuma. Love Today, I think. Is... Um, I think that's it, yeah. Um, yeah, I can look it up right now. Yeah. Because um, yeah. I ha- have them all on my phone. Um, but yes, I am, uh, cur- well, let's see. She did the song prototype. Okay. Um, yeah. No, she didn't do love today, but prototype is hers. Yeah. Okay. Ending. Yeah. So she did the first ending to the second season. Yeah. So she, yeah. that song, um, which, which that song has been in my like anime song playlist forever, but I could never remember. I remember that it was in double O Gundam somewhere, but I couldn't remember what part and i had like forgotten that it hadn't even come up watching the tv show so when that started playing um particularly like the beginning of that song is like it just has such a very memorable opening to me and i was like oh my god right this song i've totally forgot that it hadn't popped up yet um i remember liking the song so much and it's like oh fuck it was the insert song in the movie and what a damn good fucking insert song and sequence oh, it's, a, it's a stunning moment it's a great sequence it's you know it's effectively the climax to the cast as it is, because from that point on, you're with Setsuna and his evolution, and you know the final moments will be with Marina. Um, so that's kind of our last big substantive glimpses of a lot of these characters. Other than we forgot to talk, can we just? I know I already mentioned him, but can we just say like five more words about Mr. Graham Aker? Yes. And and his beautiful, beautiful ending here, because God, he is so excited to die, and I love it. Yeah, no, it's a great... I love his, like, circular character arc of where he, like, has kind of come around back to, like, an evolved version of what he was for a lot of season one. Like, particularly the beginning of season one of Gundam before his interactions with Setsuna and the Gundam sort of, like, distorted his life. Um, where it's like, he's, like, the cool, good guy captain of the team, right? Um, and he's no longer... You know, he, he has cast aside the Mr. Bushido. Like, I really want the, like... Spider-Man 2 dream sequence of I'm Mr. Bushido no more and he throws the <laughs> mask in the trash right um it seems like that's that happened to him at some point in the past um but yeah that he he is here um now living out the message that sets and left him at the end of season two which is don't fight in order to die fight in order to live and I love that Graham so he references a line he says in season one um, about Celestial being being like contradictory, and he says to Setsuna in the in, like before he sacri- Graham sacrifices himself, like be like the contradiction, like you you are that contradiction, like embrace it. Um, as Setsuna, I have it right failing. here. Failing, yeah, yeah. He, he says, "Why does your heart falter? You should be saying that you're fighting for the sake of living. To continue that existence filled with contradictions, that's what it means to live. Go forth, young man. You'll live and blaze a trail to the future." Yes, because he is the trailblazer, is uh, a Setsuna FSA, and he has a Waken. Um, yeah, so he says, like, em- like be those contradictions, embrace the contradictions, because that is what it means to live. And then right after he says that, basically, he goes, he flies in, and he, like, sacrifices himself, saying, like, this isn't dying. I have it. Yeah. He says, young man, it. Shonen, I, Grammaker, shall guarantee that you pilot into the future. This isn't dying. This is living for the survival and future of mankind. Yeah, which is, of course, a contradiction because he is dying, but he's living hes living his life the best he can um, in his own contradictory fashion. I think it's just such a strong, like, resolution to his character um, that is, yeah, that, that is to me one of, like, the big memorable stand-up moments of the movie. And it's where, um, because I, I definitely, like, if I had not already known that he has this scene at the end of the movie, I think I would have been more bummed at season two, like, on that podcast. I would have been more like, oh, I think we needed more of Mr. Bushido. But I knew we're getting, we're getting the conclusion that Graham Aker deserves uh, in the movie. 
Because he also has, you know, because he's not in the movie much, just like Graham Aker in the TV show. He doesn't have that much screen time, but every fucking second he has is like some of the best shit. Um, because yes. he also has the scene where he, um, where Setsuna is comatose and he comes up um, and talks to Felt and talks about his relationship with Setsuna, um, and which is just a very powerful moment to me of him. Like th- this relationship that they have where they are like, apart for so much they have very little interaction and yet is like to me like the most meaningful character relationship in this whole fucking series is Graham and Setsuna at the end I don't think Setsuna even knows his name because when when Graham dies Setsuna just says that man basically Hanotoko um and and like dot 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 um and he knows who Graham is, but like their relationship is like they were never friends. He never knew his name. Graham never, I don't know if he ever finds out Setsu's name because he always calls him Shonen because that's a cool thing to call your protagonist in the Gundam show. Um, and, and this like relationship they have, this weird rivalry that kind of transcends that relationship. Uh, it's one of the best like rival pilot relationships in Gundam because it's so unique and it's so powerful. And yeah, Graham flying in, sacrificing himself. So, so the shonen could go fly in and save the day. Uh, very it's, powerful man, very good boy. And like with Marina, it's you know this is a trilogy of stories, and it's built around like these tripartite structures. So, season one ends with Graham and uh, uh, Setsuna having this big confrontation that ends in them kind of blowing each other up, which throws them into season two. Season two, their big moment at the end is is. Sets it up very easily, honestly, overtaking Graham and giving him this lesson. And then, not season three, but part three, the movie, is this final confrontation where they're not fighting, they're helping each other. But Graham is able to th- show that he has actually fully learned from this, and in learning from this, helps pave the way to Setsuna's future. That Setsuna would not be able to complete what he tells us is the purpose of his life if he had not had these interactions with Graham Aker. Because yeah. he would never get into that sphere. Um, again, the planning and structure of this thing is really fucking good. Absolutely, yeah. And and Graham yeah. Aker, Mr. Bushido, whatever he wants to go by, he's he is he's one of my favorites. He's just so like it's just this character where it's hard for me to even like pin down why he's so memorable and so effective. He just is like every single moment he's on screen, like when he comes flying into the rescue in this movie is like a really great, if you were in the movie theater, you'd stand up and cheer and everyone would be clapping yes. because, because Graham Aker has shown up to save the day. Um, he's just so fucking cool. He's so fucking cool. Um, his flag in this movie is probably my favorite mobile suit he pilots. It is a sick ass fucking mobile suit. I mm-hmm. love it. Uh, I mean, everything is. This is just Gundam Double O is such an embarrassment of riches on the mobile suit front. It just like tosses off great designs that could be the centerpiece of any other Gundam show. It's it's crazy. Yeah, because everybody gets a new mobile suit in this movie, and they're all good. Like some of them, like uh, Lock Ons, is not super different from his old one, but some of them, like right. the Quanta and. Um, Tieria's new mobile suit, the Raphael, um, is, yeah, like, there's some, like, killer designs that only show up in this movie. We didn't mention Tieria. Tieria gets an interesting use in this, where they do bring back his body, but briefly. He's there for a couple scenes in body form. He lets himself die again to save Setsuna, and then he is just a part of Veda. I like that they kind of... They didn't just try to reset it and have like all four Gundam boys together again. Like he is, he has ascended the way he does at the end of the series, and that doesn't get reversed here. Uh, and I do love that he and Setsuna have become buddies enough that they go off into the great beyond together. Yeah, that's one of my favorite moments. I think that's like a really key choice they make in the movie is that Setsuna very specifically does not save the day alone. Um, yes. And I think it's important that that. It is like the most combative relationship he had within the Gundam Meisters in season one was with Tieria, who like, you know, Tieria said multiple times, Setsuna is not fit to be a Gundam Meister. Um, and then now it's fucking Setsuna and Tieria, like Cortana in Halo as the little hologram man in his yes. mobile suit, right? Um, and they go off to go save the aliens together. Um, and yeah, like, like it's, yeah, Tieria's role in this movie is very interesting because also it's, Tieria's like transcendence of humanity feels like it also kind of reflects a little bit of what the elves are too and i like that parallelism that like for Tieria, a body is just a body and i feel like you get that sense with the elves even though you don't like 
know for sure, you get the sense of like their individuality is not contained in these like single ships or entities or the trucks they turn into. Like it doesn't feel like they are getting killed when the mobile suits blow up the trucks it's evolved into. It feels like it's some sort of larger hive entity or something like that. Right. Um, that I feel like Tyria sort of like exists in a similar way to them, um, which is partially how he can process all the information they give Setsna. It's so smart because, you know, I, I saw, you know, I got my Blu-ray box in front of me and I've got the poster, which, by the way, the, the theatrical poster art for Gundam 00 is a phenomenal illustration and I mm-hmm. really want that poster on my wall. I need to see if I can find a print of that because it is a terrific movie poster. Um, but, you know, I saw, I'm like, oh, uh, you know, Thierry is on this. He does not have a body at the end of Gundam 00. I guess they're bringing him back. And, you know, my initial response to that would be like, okay, that kind of sounds like they need to reset the status quo because how do you make a Gundam 00 movie with no purple hair boy in it? Um, but they wind up using it for a very, like, for exactly what you're describing, Sean. He is in the movie in body form very briefly and mostly to make that parallel with the L's of, like, he comes back, he's in the body, he lets that body die because he needs to save Setsuna. And then he says, he's on, like, the Veda screen and he's, and they're like, oh, man, I'm sorry you lost your body again, Terry. And he's like... I, it's just, it's a shell. I don't, I'm here. You're, you're with me, you know? Um, and it's a very, very good use of the character. Uh, I also love the point Tieria makes about the, like, trinity of things Aeolia Schoenberg left behind. Of the Gundam, the Veda, and then the, the whole idea of becoming an innovator. And that all three are needed. Setsuna can't do it alone because he can't process the data. So you need Veda. And obviously he can't go fly through space and do all this shit without the Gundam. And so you put all of that together and that's what ultimately saves the day. Is, is a really cool idea. Yeah. And and I could just, you know, little little hologram Tyria Arde. Like, I... I I love him so much. I just love I just love that whole sequence. It's so heartwarming to me. There's something about their relationship yeah. that I love so much of when you find out that Ian has like Tyria instructed Ian to put Tyria into the quanta and it's like just put me in there with with my Gundam boy and we're going to go off and fly and and face the aliens together. Um yes. They're very good bros. Oh, it's great. Um I, it makes me want to go back and watch the whole series again. And just go back and knowing like where Tiaria starts and where Setsuna starts. And it's just, what a fucking journey, you know? <laughs> yeah, as someone who has seen it twice, I can say it is very satisfying watching the, the season one and being like, oh my god. Right, like here's the little boy Setsuna, here's, yeah, Tiaria's an asshole. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it is like some of like the most dramatic character arcs we've seen in this whole franchise. Yes, and and done not across like multiple series the way you know Tomino's original saga had to be done, but in like one contiguous double O. It's two seasons in a movie, but you know all made in a pretty compact time frame. That's pretty fucking impressive. Yeah, yeah. So, all right, should we focus maybe here on the on the end of the movie and the final stages? Uh, let's let's do some cleanup to hit like a couple of other characters. Just to okay. I, I think want to shout out a couple of people. Uh, I want to shout out my boy Patrick Colasar who continues. Oh to my have god, how did I forget Patrick? Some of the best shit uh, in the background. Like his relationship with Katie Mannequin is like so heartwarming. Um, I love the scene where he's like there. I one I love that Katie Mannequin and her whole thing is like situated on the base that ribbons had in season two. So all of their scenes are in that big, like palace looking area um, that all the ribbon shit was. And it's just like very weird to see normal people there and not like weird angel children. Um, And yes. And then when Patrick is trying to kiss her and then she gets a call and she just shoves him away. uh, (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's just, you get these little brief flashes of their relationship. And then of course, Patrick also gets his classic, um, you think he's going to die and then he is miraculously saved and he's flung out into space uh, and lives to, to fight another day because he is the immortal Patrick Colasar. I do love that Patrick Colasar is just floating out in space for the end of this movie and watching everything. They really, the one thing this movie is missing is the joke in like when it's 50 years later at the end that Patrick Colasar isn't also on the ship going away with all the innovators as like their invincible pilot. <laughs> And he hasn't even aged at all. Yeah, Yeah. he's just like the exact same guy. Yeah. He's great. I love his interactions with Katie. I love the joke that she is now a brigadier general, but he will not stop calling her his Tysa, his his colonel. That's great. Um, and, And I love that, like, 
you do get the sense that they do have a loving relationship, but she is very good at compartmentalizing when mm-hmm. she is on duty and when she's off. And right before she shoves him, she's reciprocating. They're about to kiss and like have this intimate moment. And then it's like she just snaps back into it and shoves him away. It's uh, Patrick Colasar, man. One of the best executed comic relief characters I've ever seen in anything. Um, just like the employment of that character from episode one to the end of this movie is phenomenal. Yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah, it's he's just very funny. I love him in this movie, and and yeah, I think there it's like because they do use him for like effective dramatic moments like that as well. That like he feels like a fully rounded out character and not just yeah. someone who's only there for jokes. Um, but when he is there for jokes, he is very funny. <laughs> yes. Who else? Um, I think that might actually be it. I think we we touched on most people. We talked about Saji and Louise. We talked about all the gun, the Gundam boys. Um, there is like, I, you know, I don't know if we have to like talk about it much. I do like there's, um, they introduced that one other innovator who's like the one on the side of the military that they kind of use for that big action scene. Um, like it's not like a super notable character, but I do like him and like the kind of the role he plays. And I think it's sort of evocative of, you get that little window of what you get a lot of in normal Gundam where it's like, just, you know, just cause you're an innovator doesn't mean that you're like a perfect person in the same way that just because you're a new type doesn't mean you're perfect um, because he's kind of a dick. That I agree, but that definitely felt like a kind of vestigial arm of the movie that sort of, I was, I was recapping the movie for myself before we did the podcast and like skipping through scenes and I saw him and I'd already forgotten that that was an arm of the movie because it's introduced. He seems significant and then he's killed in that fight midway through. And it just, I don't know. It felt, it feels a little vestigial to me. I do like the idea of having this other innovator out there. Uh, the voice actor for that character is really good, but it it didn't it doesn't really add up to anything. Um, at least on my first viewing. Yeah, I, like I don't think it's like a hugely notable part of the movie. I think it's because he's yeah. used for that exact purpose of one to to sort of establish part of like what is happening is that it's because I think it's very important to establish that Setson is not the only person who's an innovator. I think that that's really important that like. This is a thing that, like, Setson is part of a wave of people that are waking up to this, and it's not just him alone. Um, because I think it it removes a certain chosen one element from his story that I think would kind of weaken it if it was there. Sure, um, yeah. And then he's just, like, and, and a character to have there to be killed off in your, like, big action scene in the second act. Um, yes. That, yeah, he's not, like, a hugely notable character, but I do think he's used well for what the movie wants to use him for. That's fair. All right, so now should we talk about the grand finale of Gundam 00? Yes, one of the most memorable sequences to me in, in all of Gundam. So I think there's a couple points to that. I wanted to start with just the once Setsuna gets in there mm-hmm. and into the, the sphere, the egg, the it, it reminded me a lot of like Persona 3. There's some Eva in there. There's some fucking Jackson Pollock in there uh-huh. with just like the colors everywhere. Um, it's so alien. And then... I love that the entire story of the L's is just told in this trippy visual, like 2001 is the easy like comparison, but it's not actually that 2001-esque because it is so, um, it, it's it's less abstract than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a, it's a phenomenal sequence. I actually, as soon as I watched it, I rewound it and watched it twice. I, I, I It took me 10 minutes to get through that five minute scene because I watched it twice in a row. Yeah, no, there's, like, particularly there's that uh, shot of, like, it's basically like a time-lapse of that Jupiter-esque planet that they're originally from um, that is gorgeous. And you see, like, the structure of, like, their society building out of that planet. Um, Yeah, I think just, like, everything about it is so evocative. And like you say, it's, like, it's not particularly 2001 because it is very narrativized, right? It is this, like, it's almost like... I would. It's more like Fantasia esque or something, right? It's so like musical and visual like, yeah. um, with its storytelling, um, and just seeing that imagery of space. Um, there's like an a unbelievably gorgeous shot of after the sun, their sun has gone supernova, and there's like a white dwarf star in the background, and like everything is like billowed out as this cylinder while the the sphere is leaving like the husk of that planet behind. Um, it's just like yeah, there's some really gorgeous. Um, like deep space type imagery that they use there uh, in that sequence that's very powerful 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, and you talk about fit the Fantasia connection. I like that because it is like a condensed version of like the creation sequence in Fantasia. Uh, I would also compare it to the scene in The Tree of Life, which came out a year after this, um, by Terrence Malick, where it shows the creation of the universe. Uh, and the music side of this, we haven't called out yet. Kenji Kawai, obviously famous anime composer. We really liked his music for the show, but didn't talk about it a ton. I think it's even better in the movie. I think mm -hmm. the movie has a phenomenal score. I think there is some just tremendous musical stuff in this, especially in the last half hour where it is leaning on that music very hard. Um, it's a really, really good soundtrack. And it's not even recycling much from the TV show. It, it is substantially its own thing, and it's really good. Yeah, it's mostly new material. There's a couple of, like, the major themes. Because the, the soundtrack he did for the TV show is very light motif heavy. Um, and it's very effective. And so he uses yeah. some of those light motifs. Although, like, a bunch of stuff that, yeah, he doesn't necessarily bring back. He uses a lot of new material. And it highlighted for me, like, I think one of the things I had not felt about that soundtrack necessarily in the tv show but it definitely feels like it in the movie is like it it like some of the musical themes he uses including the ones that come from the tv show when you put them in this context all of a sudden it like feels very much like a kaiju movie score um like he has these like very heavier kind of military themes um in the music that he uses in the tv show all the time that didn't register me as like vaguely ifukube-esque but i think it does have like it's not it's not exactly Ifakube style of music, but it has a like tinges of that in this movie I can feel um in the big military sequences in particular that yes, I think I think yeah. much like the Zeta movie soundtrack, it just like feels like this is like the best version of what you could get from the soundtrack for Double O and it being condensed in a movie like highlights what was good about the soundtrack already. Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely correct. Um Okay, so that that scene is amazing. And then you have Setsuna and Tieria realizing they're being invited to the home planet, right? Mm -hmm. um, Setsuna has a line there that is to the effect of, this is why I was born. This is what my life was for. That line hit me really hard. And I think it is just the cumulative impact of, you know... It, they, Setsuna has this tragic origin where he was a child soldier and he was brainwashed and he murdered his own parents... And I feel like in most versions of this story, you would eventually come back around to that very directly. You would have him confront and kill Ali al Saches. You would have him in his like weird flash where he sees everybody, see his mom and dad and get to say he's sorry. You would get something of that absolution. And they never do that with Setsuna. And I think we talked about in season two why it's important he never kills Ali al Saches, that like Lyle gets to do that because... That's where Lyle is, and Setsuna has frankly moved on. And I think where what they do in place of all that, to me, is that line of Setsuna seeing all of this and seeing what he is being called to do there and saying, this is the purpose of my life. And what it communicates to me, it's so succinct, it's like five words, but what it communicates to me is that all that pain he suffered, all the terrible things that happened to him, all the people he lost along the way and the bad things he had to do, if every one of those didn't happen, he wouldn't be here right now. And there would be no hope for humanity. This is like the world works in mysterious ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, life takes you to these places. And him saying, look at this beautiful meaning to my life. And now I invite it. And once he says that, there's zero hesitation. He goes right into it. There's no long goodbyes. There's no speech. In a very Setsuna FCA way, that is it. And that feels like the perfect culmination of that character to me. Um, it's just a moment where it's like, they, they fucking get it. Perfect. Yeah, I absolutely agree. That, that you feel the weight of the full character behind that decision. And yeah, I've always loved with Double O that they, they... Obviously, they use the tragic backstory stuff a lot with Setsuna. Like, he does have that flashback and stuff. But they don't deal with it, as you say, in the way that most media would, where it's, like, not so directly his fixation, right? It's not like Batman, who has a portrait of his parents hanging over him in every room of his house <laughs> and, like, that, right? Like, it's a part of who Cessna is. It's a part of his backstory. It's like he does have this trauma very directly associated with it and that trauma sprouts into the other traumas he has like losing lock on and stuff that you see in the flashbacks in season two 
but like it's it's a part of his backstory it's a part of who he is but it's not everything about his life crystallized in this one moment of him shooting his parents that he then needs absolution for and so you need to have as you say the big in he in his like heaven that he's created with the gn particles he has an encounter with the spirits of his parents um he does it like he encounters lock on spirit he encounters the spirits of christine and the the other guy who dies at the end of season one who was with a uh, celestial being um and he sees them but he doesn't see his parents um and yeah i think it is like really powerful that that is just a fact of the character um rather than it being like what the character is about um and it's the kind of thing that like with that sort of tragic backstory it's usually just like entirely what the character is what he's about and what he does um and here it's just a part of who setsna is and even without calling to it very directly it does feel like it so much informs that revelation he has of this is what I have lived for. Like every decision I've made, everything that has happened um, has been leading up to this moment. And that means that it has been worth it. And it is worth him having lived along the way to get here. Yes. And then poof, you know, he opens the portal and uh, uh, like, what a fucking payoff to the entire idea of the double O Gundam being able to quantize that we end with a suit literally called the Q A N brackets t mm -hmm. uh and then it gets to do this just off to who the hell knows other side of the galaxy other side of the cosmos somewhere else uh and he's gone and the movie knows when to drop the mic when what he leaves behind is that flower and that symbol and um i mean at this point we are we are almost past like working in a narrative mode and it is in a poetic pure imagery pure cinema mode at a certain mm -hmm. point you know what i mean like not yes. quite that but that's more what it feels like uh in a similar way that and i it's an obvious reference this is kind of like char's counterattack yes but i think the end of char's counterattack is that too like the story you know kind of effectively ends with char's last line and then it is just watch the poetry and that's that's where we end is on this poetic note yeah, exactly. That it feels like you're sort of transcending the bounds of like the literal reality of the world in some way. In a way that like it makes it like impossible to imagine a sequel. I know that there was some talk of something, I think, connected to like the stage play version. There was something going around that there was never like any concrete deal details of like potentially doing something else in Double O Gundam World that came out with like an anniversary. But I don't know what that would even be because this feels like it's such a you have broken the world like it, it is like you are no longer in the reality you understand you have transcended into something else um like you said in a sort of poetic um world almost because there is a giant flower in space above earth um which is if you are still in the tonal space of the beginning of double o gundam would be the most ridiculous horseshit you had ever even heard of right <laughs> Um, which is why I think some people don't like this movie because if you, that is the space that you want, this is about as stark a break you could get from like the cold geopolitical discussions of the first half of season one of Double O Gundam that you could get is the giant space flower floating around Earth. Like it's the solar baby at the end of fucking 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's like it doesn't right. feel like you're supposed to read it literally as there is a giant baby that is about to come into contact with the Earth. It is representing something purely about the themes and messages of this this work of art yes yeah i there there are constantly it's it's not a rumor people involved have said things that they want to do a sequel but other than doing some kind of prequel which you know maybe there's a corner of this world that would be worth exploring i don't know my my immediate my mind would be like maybe there's a story with sergey but unsho ishizuka is dead so sadly no there is not room for a sergey story um but like it's a complete it's a closed loop like this is one of the most complete Gundam works mm -hmm. um it's just its own thing like you can always add more to the universal century you could tell a new Gundam seed story any day if you wanted to you can't tell another Gundam 00 story they they told the story it's like doing a fucking Lord of the Rings sequel like they destroyed the ring it's done is they destroyed the ring and then J.R.R. Tolkien wrote the timeline out all the way to when he got the Red Book of Westmarch and started translating it. It's very done. I feel like Gundam 00 does that with the end of like, and now we're 50 years in the future and 40% of humanity are innovators and Marina is a blind old woman and she meets Setsuna, Metal Boy Setsna again. We did it. We we took the wet Red Book of Westmarch from Hobbiton to modern day London, you know? Yeah, there's, there's very much not room, it feels like, for... Another story other than just like a side story. I don't know. Like, again, I don't know if like 
like how far along any of that is because in the same way that like technically there is a seed gundam movie that is still in production technically will that ever like surface i don't think so probably not but we'll, yeah but yes the you yeah. The, the ending of Double Gundam, it would be hilarious to see what you would try to do with a sequel and try to address the fact that there's just a... In every shot that you can see the sky, there must be a <laughs> giant flower floating in space if you said it after this movie. Okay, but you know what? It's I got a great title for it, though. Okay. Mobile Suit Gundam Double O, Flower Children. There yeah, you go. There you go. There you go. All right, a little 60s reference for you. Um, okay, and so then we get the epilogue, Sean. Um, after a very good credit song, the credit song is great. Yes, that is also uh, Uver World who did the uh, the first opening for season two. Um, they yes. did the, the song over the credits. Uh, and I shall say the opening song is by uh, the Backhorn who did Wana, the first uh, closing theme. Yes. So it's all people who did who contributed to the TV show. They keep it all in the family here. Yeah, and um, Toza, Toza Sarita Sekai, that that the opening theme to this movie is particularly good. That song fucking rules. Yeah. Um, okay, so final five minutes. We already talked, I think, about the Alolia Schuhenberg scene, but then mm. you go far to the other side, and we see this was the brain fuck for me, Sean, before we uh-huh. even get to Metal Boy Setsuna, of just, oh, they're going 50 years in the future, and there's a space station out where the flower is, and it's called the Sumeragi, and 40% of humanity have transcended to innovators, and they're doing this big mission to go meet the elves and like travel into the far reaches of space, and you see little bits of the elves' metal bonded to some people. Um, that alone is enough of a, oh, oh, they're going for it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes, and yeah. I also like that in the background of one shot, you see a Tieria... I don't think it's supposed to be like our Tyria, but there's like a Tyria floating in the background. Um, yes, so, I noticed that too. Yeah, so there, there's we still have our Innovades kicking around and doing doing weird, cool stuff. Yes, um, I do wonder about like is is it does like open some questions that you're not supposed to ask about like how is humanity working with a forty percent innovator society? Is there like a caste system? Do the people who aren't innovators like are they jealous? What's going on there? It's okay, we don't need to answer that right now. Uh, but then we do get Marina's uh, final scene where I feel like she's not. It's only been fifty years. I'm not sure why she looks quite as old as she does, especially in a future where I assume the longevity of a person's life is longer. But I guess we don't know how technically old she was in the show. Um, but anyway, I mean, she's also a fucking monarch, you know. Like, like you see how yeah. much a U.S. president ages in four years. Like, imagine that shit. But you're also living in a Gundam world. Like, imagine like okay, all the fair. shit she's been through in Double O Gundam. Like, I don't know how old she's supposed to be by the end of uh, like the run of that story. Uh, but she must have aged about 20 fucking years. It's like Barack Obama, if you look at him in 2009 versus 2016. Yes, yeah, he, yeah. yeah, he aged about 20 years in that space. Yes, it is the exact yes. same thing. So, <laughs> yes, you, you, you are reintroduced to her. She's old. She's at... Now um, I'm imagining fucking Barack Obama in like 30 years, blind, playing the piano, and then a metal, I don't know, Michelle comes in. <laughs> it's messed up. I understand anyway, sorry. You were right. Um, yes <laughs> yes so you have old marina she's playing the piano she's of course playing um the melody from the song from the show with the kids um there's like a picture frame on her uh piano that you can see that she's like lived a full life with her friends and family and stuff um it's very like rose at the end of titanic yes or it also since i you know this is where my mind always goes it is to doctor who and it's very much like the last christmas in doctor who with meeting old uh uh, Clara and like she's lived a full life uh, even though not actually because it was a dream spoilers for uh, an old episode of Doctor Who now um, but yeah so it's this she's lived this whole life on her own and she's now um, in this room playing the piano and the fucking door opens and someone walks in and she stands up and says um, sorry my eyes don't work very well um, who is it and uh, what does Sessna say he basically says like I'm back um, I think so, yeah. It's like one of the first times he doesn't look at someone and say their full name and then say his full name. Yes. Marina Ismail, I have returned. Um, he just says, I'm back, and she immediately recognizes his voice, um, and then they embrace each other, and he says, you were right, and I understand you. And, and she says, like, we, like, it's been a long time, and like we've always been passing each other by, is what Marina says to him, which I love that yeah. line that we've we've always been missing each other. Um, like in the sense of like been walking past each other basically their whole lives, and then they finally embrace each other and say that they understand each other, and the Gundam turns into flowers and the movie's over. Yes, and it is it's very good. 
just, yeah, it is such a striking ending. Again, in this, like, I feel like you just can't read the scene too literally. Like, it's, it, or like, it feels too ridiculous. Like, you can't sit there and be like, and what is Setsna's life like now as a metal boy? Um, instead, you're supposed to understand it's like, it is, you know, he has completed his mission as fully as anyone could because he is, like, he is he is the true innovator, right? He has transcended his humanity to, like, understand the L's by almost, like, becoming one of them, right? And that's, like, the culmination of his journey in this movie of seeking to understand them is he has become like them. Um, and, has, and that is this striking image of him now made of metal like they are. In, in the way that, like, I just feel like that image of him as a metal boy is so powerful um, because it also, like, I feel like it evokes that sense of his whole life He's that we've known him. He is trying to become the Gundam in a way that is what he now is, right? He is now made of metal like them. He has now, like, become that thing um, and transcended that humanity. Um, and and then he embraces her. Uh, and And I love that they continue this thread of, like, their relationship doesn't read as romantic. It just reads as this like deep friendship that both of them were seeking from the other because they're two sides of the same coin, seeking understanding from each other um, their whole lives, never quite finding it over the course of the TV show. Um, it's where like, again, like if, you, if the movie didn't exist, a criticism I would have of season two of Double O Gundam is that it doesn't feel like it really resolves properly Seth and Marina's relationship. It ends with that letter that Marina writes, which is good, but it feels like things are hanging. And this is what resolves that hanging feeling is that like, as you said, Jonathan, is this triptych structure. You have the letter from Setsuna in part one, you have the letter from Marina in part two, and then now instead of passing each other by, um, they can finally embrace each other and say that I understand who you are, you understand who I am. And it's like we are together. N again, yes. not romantically, just as like people. Absolutely. It's, it is that feeling, like I said earlier, of I'm getting better at putting it all into words now that we've podcasted for two hours on it. But like we have now, Jonathan, we have now podcasted for five minutes longer than the movie is. That's great. That's yep. how we, that's how we fucking roll. Exactly. Um, our Return to the King podcast, four hours and six minutes, bitches. That's how we go. Exactly. Anyway. Um, yes. So, uh, awake. Yeah. But but like while watching it, metal sets in a crazy image. It's very out there, and yet just it feels right because because if Gundam Double O does not end with the moment where Marina and and Setsuna are in a room together and finally have a melding of the minds, then it hasn't ended. Like that mm -hmm. is what it has to go towards, right? If if Lord of the Rings does not end with Sam getting home and saying yes, I'm back and being with his family, Lord of the Rings doesn't end. You know, it's to reference Return of the King, just ran, like that's why that movie, it's so important that it does the full Tolkien ended, yeah. ending, you know? Because if it doesn't, you haven't actually ended the story. This is ending the story. Now, did I ever predict that ending the story would involve a metal Setsuna? No. But, but you know, the importance of them coming together and the metalness of it being what allows them to do that, that is the poetry of this movie. And then ending with that phenomenal image of the Gundam there. Who boy. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is one of my favorite sequences in this franchise. It's like peculiar as it is, but partially because it's so peculiar. Yeah. It's so different. It's so, like, it, especially from, like, most of the franchise. Like, it feels like something that you maybe would see a little bit in Mobile Suit Gundam in turn A. But for most of the franchise, I feel like it just doesn't quite go to th this abstract of a place. Like, it usually yeah. has a lot of the new type stuff feels more, you know, literalized, right? It's more real. Um, and other, like, I would also say, like, the ending of F91, I think, approaches that for me. Um, it has that similar feeling. And same thing with the ending of Shars Counterattack, which I guess yeah. is, like, a theme, right? These in these movies must end with this, like, image that is so powerful and striking and poetic and transcends, like, simple narrative reality, right? Because part of, like, the reality of the ending of Gundam F91 is those two people drift off into space forever and die or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's hard to find, like, random people floating in space. Um, like, you're not meant to think about the practicalities of these two people embracing in space um, right. and floating away. You're supposed to be sitting there in the poetry of the moment um, in the same way with all the, like, the logic of the ending of Char's counterattack. It's like, it's space magic, and Char is a mama's boy. Like, it's, what, 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 do you, what logic do you need? 
Um, it, that was it, the original title of the movie: Mobile Suit Gundam, Space Magic, and Shar is a Mama's Boy. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, it, I like that this trend of our Gundam movies end with this like striking moment of poetry. Yes, well, I might even argue Narrative Gundam does that for me. There's the best thing in Narrative Gundam is the last like five minutes of that movie. I'm going to be um, honest; I feel like I've forgotten most of Narrative Gundam. I, that that's movie, okay. That I liked that one more. Me. Maybe we have to do an actual podcast on that one when we get yeah. there, because uh, we didn't give it its full due, and it is the other movie. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's Sean Gundam Double O is is so good. I I said last time on the show that I would hold off on saying where I would like maybe definitively place this in my Gundam canon until I saw the movie and saw it through. And especially after having seen the movie and talked to you about it for the last two hours and nine minutes now, I, this is in my top tier, I think. I think Gundam 00 is, is on the shelf up on the, the uppermost level for me. Or if not, then the level right below it. But one or two, it is. I don't mean it is the one or two, but if I'm doing my like dumb tier list thing... It's either it's either double S or S. I mean, we'll we'll have to revisit the rankings in like shockingly not that long because it's like I know, frighteningly June. close to the second anniversary of the podcast, uh, where we'll we'll have to talk about our rankings again. And yeah, like I mean, I will say that th- watching this movie again and just how much I like it because I really love this movie a lot. Like I think this would, I I would put this above F ninety one for me. Like I don't think it's above Shars Counterattack, but I think this would be my second favorite of the the hand. Like I think I like it more than any of the Mobile Suit Gundam. Like for putting all the Gundam movies in the original yeah. trilogy of Mobile Suit Gundam movies, and I mean the Zeta ones aren't like quite in that competition. Um, like I really love this movie, and I think it does kind of push it maybe for me almost into that space. So I'd have to sit there and look at that. Um, because Mobile Suit Gundam right. and Turn A Gundam are a hell of a fucking thing but it might be in that tier um it is it is certainly the closest thing uh yeah. because yeah it, it, this was like the, watching this movie was a really interesting experience because this is something i was both looking forward to and dreading i was looking forward to it because i was like i really need to watch this movie again because i feel like i didn't know what to make of it the first time i watched it again when i watched it i didn't even know aliens are going to be in it before i watched it so i was really thrown for a loop when i watched this movie for the first time um but like I was kind of dreading it because I know that there are some people that really hate this movie, and I was like, "What if this movie is just bad? Like, what if like I just come down really negative on it?" And I am so in the opposite direction. Like, I feel like I might feel about this movie, Jonathan, the way you feel about F ninety one of that. Like, yeah, I rec- I can recognize a lot of its flaws, but holy shit, like the stuff this movie does well, it just like hits me so hard. Um, it really it is like a huge plus to double O as a right. like story to me that like just how good this movie is. Yeah. And when I say I'm like tearing it, I'm thinking of double O as like one full thing, not yes, breaking too. out the movie. Cause like as a movie, I do like F 91 more than this movie, but obviously as a full entity, double O is more substantial than F 91. There's no, it would be in a higher tier than F 91. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to break it out. Like this, this Shars counterattack and F ninety one are their own things. You would rank. It would be hard to rank the Double O movie apart from the show for me. So we'll have to discuss that when we yeah. get there to our rankings. Uh, luckily, this is our show and we can do whatever the fuck we want. I'm, so. I'm going to say right now we're not mid- rating this as something separate than the show because it's <laughs> Good. because it's not trying to be right. It's not. No, it's, it's not even making a vague attempt of trying to stand apart from the the TV show. That yeah, I think it would be kind of impossible. Um, it's a to, movie length finale and yes. you just put them all together and double O is this thing that sits on your shelf in one big happy family. Yeah. Um, but should we now tell the kids about where we're going next, Sean, with Gundam? Yes. So so we're not going to quite jump into the next full length TV show, which will be Mobile Suit Gundam Age quite yet, because there has been a very weird, strange corner of Gundam that has just been hanging around here in the 2000s for a little bit that we haven't addressed yet. And now at this point in the timeline, it has finished. So it feels like if we're going to do it, we have to do it now. And I want to rewatch these because I don't remember anything about the first half of it. And I remember the second half having some interesting stuff. So we're going to watch all of the MS Igloo episodes. Um, So that's MS Igloo 1 and 2. Um, And we will do all of that as one big episode because they're all kind of short things on their own. We are going to, you know, it was appropriate, Jonathan, that we were talking about some CGI stuff uh, earlier in this episode, because <laughs> if you want some CGI, we're about to get it, because what MS Igloo is, um, which is MS Igloo, The Hidden One Year War, and MS Igloo Apocalypse 0079, which are basically one story split into two parts, 
and then MS Igloo 2, um, which are like is kind of an anthology story. The thing that combines them all together is that they are all fully CGI productions. So some of these were yes. made in 2004. And so set your expectations for the ones made in 2004 appropriately. But by the time you get to 2009 for MS Igloo 2, the, the CGI is going to get better. So I'm going to say for people starting to watch MS Igloo, if you have not seen it before, maybe set your expectations appropriately for the visual quality you're going to see for the beginning yes. of MS Igloo. There is a Blu-ray set that just has everything in it, um, so you don't have to like search around. Um, or you can find it elsewhere, but but it is a it is tad confusing. I believe it's nine half hours total. Yeah. Um, so we're going to do that. And then I, at this point, am getting questions online pretty much every day of, are you covering this? Are you covering that? Right now, the plan, the path we are on, is finishing all of the Gundam, main Gundam, not SD Gundam. Maybe one day, just for now, we're pretending SD Gundam doesn't exist. So put that away. I'm, I'm just going to say, Jonathan, we are never going to do a full SD Gundam series. We might do an episode on like the shorts, because I've seen sure. some of the shorts. Um, that were like like that they were aired in front of some of like the movies like Shars Counterattack in the original trilogy. We might hit those at some point. They're kind of hard to find, also. But yes. I'm going to say I would I would refuse to watch like the SD Gundam show that aired on Toonami in like 2005 and shit like that. Nuh uh, we ain't going there. Okay. So there you go. You have it from Sean himself. But after this, so so what does that mean? We're going through all of it. Well, we are going to be doing Gundam Age. Uh, Gundam Age is not a two-season show, but it is a four-arc show, and we're going to split it into two episodes with two parts on each of those. So, set your expectations accordingly. Then you hit the, the original Build Fighters and its sequel, Build Fighters Try, uh, and we'll also cover some of the Build Fighters OVAs, so that'll probably be around three episodes. G Reco, uh, Reckon Gista in G, is one 26-episode season, so that will be one episode. We're going to hit Iron-Blooded Orphans, seasons one and two. After that, then you get to the point where Gundam Thunderbolt has done its two movies slash seasons. Uh, and then finally, Gundam The Origin, which finishes in 2018. So that's where we will put it in the timeline. And at that point, we will be caught up full circle to the Gundam that had existed when Weekly Suit Gundam started. <laughs> and then you have Build Divers and Build Divers Rerise, which have aired since we started this podcast. Which is pretty crazy. And you haven't seen them, Sean. No, I've seen a few episodes of Gundam Build Divers, um, and then I was like, like I can't watch this and watch other Gundam stuff at the same time. It was like, I'm just going to save it. So, yeah, I, I yeah. know very little about those shows other than what the first three episodes are, and that it's basically an isekai show in the style of like a Sword Art Online is most of what I know about Build Divers. Yeah. So we'll get to all of that. It's gonna that's thirteen episodes of content that I just listed out. And so we're not gonna be doing that all at once, obviously. Um, but that is the master plan going forward. Um, there will be other things that will enter in. Mobile Suit Gundam Hathaway is going to come out somewhere in the middle of that, and we will review Hathaway when it comes out, obviously. I, we're not gonna hold off on that because we're gonna watch it and we're gonna talk about it, right, Sean? Oh yes, absolutely. I'm yeah. I'm very excited. The the trailer they showed a few weeks ago looked very cool. Yeah, so at some point that'll be out here and we'll talk about that. Um, we're going to do at some point a Crossbone Gundam episode on that six-volume manga because it's great. Yes, I still want to do my episode on the Gundam novelization. There are lots of things we can do. There are other anime. But just recognize, we do the finish line is in sight for Gundam on TV. And that is sort of our main push for now. When it's over, that doesn't mean we're going to shut off Weekly Suit Gundam and not do any more Gundam talks. So if you have other things you want us to talk about, that's okay. Just this is the immediate game plan. Does that sound fair? I think that sounds like a good plan to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm very excited to, to get to some of this stuff. And then also, if, if people listen to this podcast but don't listen to the weekly stuff, if you like us talking about anime, we will be talking about Kimetsu no Yaiba also. So if you're not just only interested in mecha stuff um, but want to hear some other anime talk... We'll be doing yes. that soon uh, because also the movie's coming out soon. And I got my tickets for that uh, just the other day. So I got my tickets too. So actually the next two weeks of the Weekly Stuff podcast are both Kimetsu no Yaiba episodes. We're going to be recapping season one and then we're going to be talking about the movie. So I might even put those in the Weekly Suit Gundam feed as well just because they're anime based. I, they probably won't be Weekly Suit Gundam episodes, but just in case people are interested. Yeah, because um, I've got to say right now, I'm going to be referencing Gundam a lot <laughs> when we're talking about Kimetsu no Yaiba because it's now it becomes the lens through which I understand anime. 
Yes. So, you know, uh, maybe that'll show up in your feed. Um, but either way, you should subscribe to the Weekly Stuff podcast because it's a good show, too. And if you like us talking about Gundam, you'll probably like us talking about other things. Uh, it'd be weird if you didn't. Um, but yeah, so Sean, we have we have podcasted for about seven hours total about Gundam 00. Does that sound good? <laughs> It's pretty. I think we did a pretty good job. We might want to do just another wrap up episode just to talk about. We just do a Patrick Colasar fan podcast. I think that will be the last one we do on Double Up. 